Sam Cena. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cena. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cena. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, June 15th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Professor of American Studies at the University of Kansas, David Rodiger, on his book, The Sinking Middle Class, A Political History. Also on the program today, new emails reveal Trump's pressure on the DOJ to help reverse the 2020 election results. Vermont now at an 80% vaccination rate, highest in the country, as coronavirus infections continue to drop where vaccination rates are high. Imagine that. Also on the program today, Mitch McConnell admits that Joe Biden will get no Supreme Court picks if the Republicans control the Senate, period, end of story. Kenji Brown and Jackson confirmed to sit on the nation's second most powerful court. As the Republicans plot to kill the infrastructure bill, House Democrats contemplate a line in the sand. Former NSA contractor reality winner is released from jail. She had been imprisoned for leaking Information on rushing, Russian hacking of voter rolls to The Intercept. U.S. and E.U. finally settle on airline, uh, excuse me, airplane maker subsidies. That was a long fight. The Texas grid is near collapse again, facing record heat and a deregulated system of providing energy. And lastly, production comes back online slowly. Inflation fears are beginning to ease. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, Happy you could make it all. Joining me as always, Emma Vigeland. Hello, Emma. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I am uh, good. A little sleepy today. A little sleepy today, but uh, all's well that. Well, I mean, has does, all's well that doesn't sleep well. You up late watching uh, Paul George last night? Uh, I uh, no, it's just a classic, uh, classic case of PG's back. Son, no, it was just uh, my son just woke me up early multiple times that's all nothing what, what reason today um you know same gotta go to the bathroom hey are you awake dad i am now all right great thanks for telling me bye-bye and that's that that's basically what it was <laughs> um uh so uh we have a new uh judge on the uh, dc uh circuit court the court of appeals this is the second highest most powerful, most important court in the country when you have uh, a lot of administrative questions about the functioning of our government. It happens at this court. There is a um, a lot of uh, interesting history recently over the past, I say, 10, 15 years of this court. Uh, at one point, the Republicans during the Obama years were uh, basically blocking so many judges to be on this court that... Um, They had woefully too few judges, but we're actually talking about, if you can believe it, 
changing the number of justices on this D.C. Circuit Court. Just so happened they wanted to freeze it in at a point where they still had a uh, majority, or I believe maybe at that point it was tied. And by the way, this is Merrick Garland's replacement. Well, and then ultimately uh, what happens is uh, that is why Harry Reid got rid of the filibuster or was rid of, gotten rid of under that under his uh, leadership of the Senate at that time to fill those vacancies on that D.C. Circuit Court. There have been many rulings coming out of that court since then. And then, of course, as, as you said, Emma, Merrick Garland was sitting on that court when he was nominated for the Supreme Court seat that was vacant that Mitch McConnell decided in February of that year, of the last year of uh, Barack Obama's presidency, that you could know there's no way you could seat a Supreme Court justice in the last year of a presidency because an election was only 10 months away. And then, of course, that seat remained vacant. And Neil Gorsuch... um, Filled that seat, put a pin in that. And then, of course, uh, Mitch McConnell um, ultimately decided that when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, three weeks actually was all you needed to before an election to seat a justice. And well, so, don't you see? It's because the Senate was controlled by the Republican Party and the presidency. So that was his loophole. Right. That was the loophole. It makes a lot of sense. It's a very convoluted rule that he's coming up with on the fly. Well, the rule is, is that McConnell will do what uh, is in most favor to Republicans. And there were many people in the legal profession. And Mitch McConnell uh, essentially said, we'll we'll talk about this later in the program, but essentially said on the radio uh, with um, Hugh Hewitt, the odious Hugh Hewitt yesterday, uh, that, yeah, yeah. we're not going to seat anybody in 2024. We probably won't seat anybody in 2023. In other words, if the Republicans get control of the Senate, done. No more Supreme Court justices. Uh, meanwhile, Stephen Breyer has indicated that he refuses to resign for political uh, reasons and timing. I guess it's only going to be just a function of his health. They're going to have to wheel him out of there. Um, How honorable. But yes. Yes. Because his sense of what is right is far greater of greater import than the implications of the Supreme Court. And uh, in fact, this is a an affliction that many in the legal profession have. Yep. And um, this is a perfect example of it. Mitch McConnell has just announced this. We know that there were almost 130 some odd vacancies, maybe 50 vacancy, 150 vacancies, because Barack Obama was frankly slow to get uh, nominees up. But once the Republicans controlled it, there was no there. There was simply no uh, way to get past that obstruction until Harry Reid uh, pulled the trigger on the um, on the nuclear option for judges under, you know, under the Supreme Court. And they started to get, uh, seat some uh, judges, but they couldn't catch up because they were slow to do so. Well, here is Neil Katyal on uh, MSNBC the other day and understand that Neil Katyal went on television and testified in favor of Neil Gorsuch, completely ignoring the context in which Neil Gorsuch was um, was uh, nominated to the Supreme Court. That seat was vacant, period, end of story, because Mitch McConnell used unprecedented obstruction in keeping that seat vacant. Here is uh, Neil Katyal. Neil, if there was a model created by the last... White House for anything. It was Don McGahn, then White House counsel's pipeline with Mitch McConnell to speed confirm federal judges. Is it's my understanding that that is one thing that this um, administration is seeking to emulate? Yeah, it's not just Nicole. I think the speed of confirmations. I think it's the composition. So Donald Trump really did nominate some of the most brilliant conservative judicial candidates around. If I took a legal pad out right after Trump was elected and put the 20 leading conservative lawyers on that legal pad, I would say 15 are now on the courts of appeals. Um, You know, he missed almost no one. And, you know, that's the model that I think the Democrats should be emulating, not just fast confirmations, but quality, you know, in terms of people who are able to persuade. I see it all the time. I'm in federal court, particularly the appeals court a lot. And, 
We are fighting with one hand tied behind our back because we have not sent up those types of nominees who have the intellectual firepower, who know how to persuade. Trump did set that up. And that's why, like this judge, Katanji Brown Jackson, mm -hmm. uh, that is going to be confirmed, it looks like, in the next few days up for the Court of Appeals, is 100 percent a step in the right direction. She's amazing. Now, uh, putting aside his assessment of uh, Kenjongi, uh, uh, Kenji uh, Brown uh, Jackson, and putting aside that for a moment, um, I, I'm not even sure I fully understand what he's saying here, except for it sounds like he's saying that when he goes into the court, the judges that have been appointed by Democrats in the past don't seem to be able to uh, reason well, or I don't know what he's saying. Although we do know that he wanted to be a part of, uh, there was uh, rumors they want to be a part of the administration. He's not, in part because this guy has a record in addition to going up and uh, uh, promoting Neil Gorsuch. And there is a belief, at least in some in the legal profession, that, um, that the reason why you see some of these elite lawyers do this is because they want to be on the, uh, they know that despite the high intellect involved in their ability to argue in a court of law, that what also counts is that you're on the right side of the judge. And they want to be able to place, when they're professors, they want to be able to place clerks in these uh, uh, judges' um, uh, chambers. They also want to be able to be on the right side of these judges. Here is uh, Brian Fallon, who is the uh, executive director of Demand Justice, I think it's called. And he uh, also was an Obama, um, uh, uh, in the Obama administration. And this is his response. I would say we've been fighting with one hand behind our back because supposedly progressive lawyers like Neil Katyal have gone out and endorsed judges like Neil Gorsuch because it helps his corporate clients to be on friendly terms with the justices. Yeah. I mean, the one thing is that Katyal was never a progressive. I, I, his bio says extremist centrist. Well, I mean, let's let's just because he was a part of the Obama administration. I mean, this has been like the the. The idea that there's these, you know, brilliant conservative legal minds, one of that, that's an oxymoron. But two, I mean, it, 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 as you say, this is a part of the legal profession, this like fetishization of process as opposed to the content of one's decisions and like the academia behind it, well, um, which is really a cover for the exact dynamic that was point, pointed out by, by Brian Fallon there. Yeah. I mean, let's be clear. Um, it's not a uh, it's not a fetishization for the sake of, uh, of fetishizing it. This is about big money. Yes. Neil Katyal was in front of the court um, uh, six months ago, seven months ago in front of the Supreme Court arguing that corporations have should have full immunity for global child slave labor regime that take place or i should say the global child labor regime that corporations who function in this country do not have responsibility if they are sourcing materials or uh, products from uh, entities that are using child um, child slave labor a, B, uh, there's other examples of Neil Katyal going up in front of the court. He went up uh, in front of uh, the Supreme Court to essentially um, expand or rewrite, in many respects, the Federal Arbitration Act as a way of preventing, ultimately, um, a, a type of class action suits, which is just a bar to regular citizens having redress against corporations in a court of law. So to be clear, when someone says they're a radical centrist, what they're saying is, I have a lot of corporate clients and I'm going to do whatever it takes to maintain and protect their interests. And if that involves um, going and promoting conservative justices, because ultimately I know I'll be in front of that court arguing on behalf of corporate interests, that's what I will do. Uh, and that's what he's doing. And so this notion of having to inflate the intellect of Donald Trump's judges who were handpicked by the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society um, and to somehow say that the reason why Democrats haven't placed on the court uh, judges is because their intellect isn't high. Donald Trump had more people who were rejected, more nominees who were rejected by the ABA than any 
any president in the history of the United States. Yeah, Brett Kavanaugh, Mr. Beer, really just screams just brilliant legal mind to me. Yeah, I mean, it's absurd. It's simply absurd. And then, of but course, this the is someone courts, yeah. this is someone who is just trying to curry favor. And so, you know, I mean, this is this is I don't know. It's it is it's literally uh, going on television to um, to network in some way, and to uh, help their uh, candidates. So the real bottom line is is that what has to happen is okay. Democrats need to get on the ball, and they need to start nominating, and they need to start pushing them through uh, quickly, because it's quite clear that as soon as Mitch McConnell gets control of the Senate, done. There will be no more uh, nominees from the uh, Biden administration. That will be over, completely over. And that, that is the most important takeaway when it comes to judges, not that they meet the uh, standards of a corporate attorney's um, uh, sense of what intellect constitutes. And let me be also clear. Lawyers uh, can provide representation to any client they want. That's their job. But this is not the equivalent of criminals needing uh, defense attorneys. There is, there is no like sort of higher um, uh, principle that's involved here. You don't have to take corporate cases. There's plenty of people lying up to that to do that. This is not a question of the state imposing. Um, well, you know, I mean, that's uh, just that's just what corporate attorneys say to themselves so that they can like justify being a Democrat at the same time. I mean, that's really that's that's the audience you're speaking to. There is that not is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, it's just people who 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 who, who claim on some level that like, well, I have a responsibility as a lawyer to take every you know a, a, any client. No, you, you know, I have a responsibility that, to bill seven hundred dollars an hour to represent Exxon Mobil. That is what America is all about. I got some bad news for you: seven hundred dollars an hour. Am I Try really twelve fifty. I think probably uh, with a guy at least, at least, <laughs> okay. at least. All right. All right. With all that said, at least. With all that said, um, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to David Rodiger, uh, foundation professor of American studies at the University of Kansas, author of *The Sinking Middle Class: A Political History*. Right back after this. Man, nothing gets my uh, goat. Jesus Christ! What? Nothing gets my goat more than. Um, I, I mean. Yeah, when we were talking about lawyers, uh, lawyers, yeah. Yep, uh, folks, those lawyers may get my goat, but um, what gets my, yeah. Uh, nope. What shaves my goat? Oh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to transition into the uh, Harry's uh, read today, and uh, well, folks, I mean, look at. Well, I'm a couple of days out, but uh, what well, another great thing about Harry's? You don't have to shave every day if you don't want to. Oh, right. There you go. Uh, and Even if you're on camera and you're like ostensibly supposed to look presentable. I think I look presentable. You do. You do. Thank you. You do. Thank I you, Emma. Mean, I just mean like, wow. you know, that's the... That's well, the, the upshot uh, with Harry's, right? you think, I think you, you, you're digging. I would stop digging. Yep. Uh, you don't have to choose between a great shave and a fair price. Um, and neither should any guy in your life. Do you know what's coming up, Emma? Father's Day? Correct. I got it right now. With Father's Day approaching, there's never been a better time to try or share the Harry's experience. You can redeem a trial set for just $3 or get $5 off any shave set when you go to harrys.com slash majority. Harry's gift set makes a great gift for any guy in your life year-round. And their new graphite Winston razor handle is even engravable. So you can personalize your gift. For me, personally, I have to tell you, as I mean, I'm saying this as a father in general, but also I probably yeah, I probably felt this way before I was a dad. Uh, I like a gift that I can use every day. It doesn't have to be something that mm -hmm. is like, oh, my God, a you know, where did you find this? I, like, I like a gift I can use every day that I like that to me. If, I, if there's anything I can integrate into my life every day that I like um, and I love my Harry's razor, it didn't didn't come as a gift. But I mean, what do and you the body do? wash. Uh, and, oh, they've got the body wash yeah. now. They've got the, they have a, um, they have a shaving gel. But uh, for me, I like a simple razor. And Harry's delivers a close, comfortable shave. They do it at a fair price, as low as $2 per refill. They bought their own factory in Germany. It's been making precision engineered blades for over 100 years. They've got a, they've combined an ergonomic handle with a signature blade cartridge. They also, they have a travel cover. It's great. 
It really is nice. And um, they stand behind the quality of their blades so much, they have a 100% money-back guarantee on harrys.com. So check it out. Harry's has given their best offer to Majority Report listeners. New Harry's customers can get a starter set for just three bucks. Three bucks. Plus, Harry's is doing a limited time offer for all customers starting now through Father's Day. Wow. You don't have much time. You can take $5 off any shave set at harrys.com slash majority. It's truly never a better time to try Harry's. Go to harrys.com slash majority to start your own Harry's journey or to save a few bucks on a special gift for that special dad in your life. I don't know what you would do with your non-special dad, but yeah, do that too. Um, I had an interesting experience years ago. I don't even remember when this was. Uh, I don't even know where, where the context was. I think I was on some type of long flight somewhere. I feel like this is 25 years ago. And this guy I'm sitting next to goes like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm developing a new type of mouthwash because you know that there's alcohol in mouthwash? And I'm like, I had no idea. Oh, well, you're not like a really intense alcoholic who drinks well that's what he like said to movies. me that's what he said to me he's yeah. like you know how you know that guy working uh, in the office with you who's got the mouthwash in the uh, drawer that's what's going on and i'm like i, I don't work in an really office. yeah uh and i oh, sorry that's good. sad yeah. but uh no but i i don't i didn't i said i don't work in an office i mean i don't i've never worked next to anybody with a drawer so uh but uh bottom line I don't, know, I don't know whatever happened to that guy, but mouthwash has basically been like that for 140 years. Plus, most brands sell those big, bulky bottles that are full of water and alcohol. But that's why oral care experts at Quip have created a mouthwash that gives you uh, more of the ingredients you need, and it comes in an eco-friendly refill bottle that's 100% recyclable. Whoa. Now, look, you've heard me talk about Quip. I love their toothbrushes. My kids all use their toothbrushes. My kids love their uh, their watermelon toothpaste. I love their mint toothpaste. It's my, what I do at least twice a day. I brush my teeth with that. Also, you've heard me talk ad nauseum about the Quip refillable flosser. We've never even advertised for that. And I've talked about it. Yeah, you uh, love that. I flosser. love that thing. I also love the uh, the like the Pez dispenser gum that they have. They're they're just a great design company. I have not tried this mouthwash yet, uh, but if it is anything like anything else that they have designed, it is going to be fantastic. Uh, their four times concentrate has apparently fluoride, xylitol, and CPC. Not sure what CPC is, but. Um, good for them. They left out the artificial colors and the stinging alcohol you'll find <clears throat> in a lot of other rinses. And you can get a customizable subscription. You can get refills automatically delivered straight to your door every three months. That's basically, this is my whole life now. I'm trying to automi automi automate everything. Right. Quip's refill bottles are made from 100% recyclable plastic. The mouthwash is the perfect finishing touch to complete oral care routine. You pair it with a Quip Electra toothbrush, like I say, for both adults and kids, the refillable flossers, and Quip's great tasting, good for you gum that can help your teeth clean between brushings. And believe me, you got to start your good dental care early, people. Don't wait until you're my age, because then you're screwed. And it affects so much other, so many yep. other parts of your health. If you get to if you go to getquip.com slash majority five right now, you can get five dollars off a mouthwash starter kit. That's five dollars off a mouthwash starter kit, which includes a refillable dispenser and a 90 day dose supply of Quip's four times concentrated formula at getquip.com slash majority five spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash majority five. Quip, the good habits company. And finally, uh, today's program is also sponsored by the sponsor of my breakfast and my snack every day. Uh, that, of course, is Magic Spoon. I was so excited when the box showed up yesterday. I was about you to were. order more, and I was like, oh, phew, it's here. Healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. And right now, they are letting you BYOB. Build your own box. Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs in each serving, only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, it's gluten-free, it's grain-free, it's soy-free, it's low-carb, it's GMO-free. And with the Build Your Own Box, you can have four of the available flavors to build your own, very own custom bundle. The choices you get are cocoa, 
My number two or three flavor, fruity, frosted peanut butter. My number two or three, blueberry. And my number one flavor, cinnamon. You can even choose all the same flavor if there's one you really love. My kids love the fruity and the frosted. And the blueberry, I would say, comes in second or third with them. Uh, but uh, check it out. You will love this. And I, I, was, I don't know if I'm supposed to mention this because I, I'm on the, uh, I signed up for the uh, VIP for the first Ooh. announcement of the um, flavors. I ordered that uh, jelly donut, and we were in the uh, studio yesterday, and I was like, I gotta try it. I, I don't I have no idea. It tastes like jelly donut. And you forget, like, I haven't had a jelly donut in a long time. Those I are my, how, they're my favorite donuts. The, I mean, I love That is really donuts. good. I don't yeah. think that's available anymore. That's one of those seasonal flavors that they have. Oh. But um, the cinnamon still is my super go-to. Folks, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great tasting cereal, and you can feed it to your kids and not feel like you're a horrible parent. <laughs> Go to magicspoon.com slash majority report, grab a custom bundle of cereal, try it today, and be sure to use our promo code majority report at checkout, save $5 on your order at Magic Spoon is so confident in the product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like it for any reason, they refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, it's magicspoon.com slash majority report, use the code majority report, save $5 off. Uh, all of that will be available at YouTube and our podcast description. All right. Want to uh, welcome to uh, the program David uh, Rodiger. He uh, is the Foundation Professor of American Studies at the University of Kansas, author of The Sinking Middle Class of Political History. Uh, David, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm here with Emma Vigeland. Hi to both of you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm even rereading the book. Hey, Market is doing a um, kind of text edition, classroom edition next year, and so I'm working on it. I well, forgotten too much oh well i'm glad to have inspired you to reread your own book <laughs> <laughs> so all right well let's just start as it's, it's fresh in your mind um give us like the the uh the the background on the term middle class like the development of it and uh, i guess it's etymology well um middle class is is um a kind of a catch-all term that um has uh, both meanings about how people get defined into it and what they choose to call themselves. And it sort of always, always has. In the 19th century and before, uh, it tended to mean people who were self-employed, who farmed, uh, who uh, had uh, independent businesses, who were free professionals. Um, by the 20th century, and C. Wright Mills, the great sociologist, really gives us the terminology here, uh, um, a new middle class uh, was uh, overwhelmingly employed, salaried, uh, working in white collar jobs, working in sales. Uh, so the, the term uh, changes meaning and in a way that matters in U.S. history, because sometimes the ideology in the U.S. wants to say, well, it's always been a middle class uh, nation. And one of the things that I discuss in the book is that it almost never used the term middle class in the 19th century, for example. And the middle class of today is so different from what we think of as the 19th century, retrospectively as the 19th century middle class, that it doesn't really make too much sense to draw that, that line. When, when did it start getting used in the United States in any, uh, this is the thing that I think sort of surprised me about your book. Like I, my presumption was like, oh, in the 1950s, it was all about the middle class, but that's really yeah. more sort of like the way that we look back on it. Right, right. Well, in the, in the 19th century, uh, and we know this from kind of search engines and, and uh, of the digitized uh, work from the 19th century, that the term was very little used in the United States and very much when it was used, was used to describe uh, European middle classes. And the U.S. had a kind of a fascination with the middle class as a European uh, thing. So it's really in the 1930s that you begin to get some traction for U.S. use of the term middle class, partly as a way to sort of um, challenge the CIO and the idea of working class upsurge in the 1930s. But your 50s uh, reference is not far from the mark. The apogee of all this was the Cold War. And it was really very much a patriotic uh, Cold Warring thing to describe the United States as a middle class nation. 
And it's then that we really see on the graphs of usage, a kind of a skyrocketing of the use of the term middle class. And then when the Cold War ends, it goes down, but it goes down in popular usage, as far as we can tell, but uh, goes far up in political usage. By the 90s, you begin to get the middle class as being the dominant rhetoric for how people conduct political campaigns, presidential political campaigns in the United States. And was the function in the Cold War to essentially create this ideal for America that was contrasting with, you know, the the communist version uh, vision uh, at, in the USSR? I mean, what what function did that serve in terms of um, national morale in the context of that growing uh, acrimonious relationship? Yeah, the, the idea was very much to um, set the United States apart. And it wasn't just ideology. I mean, there was quite a subsidy to suburbs and to the kind of growth of a middle class uh, lifestyle from the U.S. state uh, in this in this period. But the one of the very famous moments of the Cold War is this uh, so-called kitchen debate between Khrushchev and Richard Nixon in the late fifties, and Khrushchev. Uh, uh, and Nixon were both in this model kitchen in the Soviet Union, but showing a U.S. kitchen. And uh, Nixon really wanted to pick a fight about this because he wanted to say it's the middle class, stay-at-home wife, uh, home that sets the United States apart from and above the Soviet Union. Ironically, this was at a time when you were beginning to get massive workforce participation by United States women. But the ideology of it was to say, we, we don't have cafeterias, we don't have mass childcare like in the Soviet Union, we don't have women working. So it was a very gendered kind of ideal as well as a class ideal that took hold in that period. How, how much it was its deployment a reaction to uh, the way that class was talked about uh, by Marx? Like, how much was it a, as a way of obscuring um, class differences that might have more operative functioning in society? Oh, I think that's definitely true. And, and uh, one of the big forces behind the middle class was the Chamber of Commerce and groups like the National Association of Manufacturers. They liked the term and they liked um, kind of classical maybe mistranslated uh, uh, references to the middle class or the middle classes uh, going all the way back to Aristotle. They would quote these uh, Whitman saying the middle class is the core of society and Rand. Uh, this kind of ran through a lot of uh, usages. And some of the first usages in the 30s, uh, prominent usages were to say, uh, you might read about the uh, industrial unions every day in the paper, but the United States remains a middle class society, and it's a, and that's the glory of the of the United States. So it was very much pitched as an alternative to people considering themselves working class. And and what is that? What, what did that? What 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 was the agenda behind pitching that? Was that essentially as a way of saying um, we don't want there to be class solidarity within a difference between capitalists and um, and and labor, let's say, uh, that if we obscure that and sort of like create a bridge that it's more um, experiential uh, outside of work than it is sort of experiential, I guess, in the context of work. Is that right? right. Yeah. And, and the middle class also comes to be seen as being very largely about consumption and, as you say, off the job. Uh, life. So yes, I think it, it does uh, redirect the attention from what people would have called then the shop floor in factories to the middle class home, the suburban home, and it makes it more plausible. You begin to hear in the late 40s and early 50s about the auto worker as a middle class, highly paid, unionized, good union job uh, person. And that's very much uh, in reaction to the power of the UAW and to the power of the UAW in the factory. And then to, to say, no, actually, it's the, it's the home, it's the boat, it's the cabin that makes somebody middle class. Um, and at what point, or I mean, I imagine at, at what point does it become 
racialized. I mean, is that is that take us to Stanley Greenberg and and uh, the, like that that era, or uh, is it is it is it racialized in a sort of a less um, I guess just uh, that the nature of our society was such when you're talking about the 30s and the 40s and the 50s uh, and into the 60s that. Uh, w w when we talk about any phenomena, we're just talking about white people. Um, I mean, what, what what point does it become sort of more self-consciously racialized? Well, as far as we can tell, uh, black people were less likely by the 40s uh, to call themselves middle class than white people and were less likely to be in these uh, so-called middle class uh, occupations. So in that sense, I think it was always uh, racialized. But it really is in the 80s uh, and 90s with Stanley Greenberg and Bill Clinton that we begin to, to see uh, a kind of a, an obfuscation about this, that, that uh, you don't, you, when you say middle class, you mean white middle class, and everybody knows that you mean uh, white middle class. So there's, it becomes a way to appeal for white votes without uh, saying the word white. Tell us more about Stanley Greenberg, because I have been reading his polling for, I don't know, 15 years and never really contemplated how important his role in the development of, I mean, I, I mean, arguably our politics more, you know, broadly, but uh, certainly Democratic politics. Yeah, uh, I became fascinated with Greenberg. I came to this project trying to uh, think about how it was that middle class, that both parties appeal to the middle class overwhelmingly in electoral campaigns. And I really uh, thought of it in, in 2012 and signed a contract for it and then did other books instead. Uh, but the, um, the 2012 election was the high point of this uh, Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter, you're appealing to the middle class. Romney and Obama, they both had the same definition for the middle class, which was people that made uh, $250,000 or less. So it included all of the poor and almost all of society. 96%. They, 96%, yeah. Yeah. So that's the key to winning an election. And sure enough, it is if you can get the 96% to, to vote for you. Um, but this very much goes to uh, Greenberg's project. And his project was as a kind of an ex-Marxist uh, uh, political scientist uh, at Yale and was denied tenure at Yale, his second career becomes this pollster career for the Democratic Party. And he's particularly charged with trying to figure out why it is that white, uh, at originally people said working class, uh, suburban uh, uh, former Democrat voters were voting uh, for Reagan. So the so-called Reagan Democrat becomes what he sent to Michigan, to Macomb County, Michigan, to research. And he very much uh, decides that the key to winning elections uh, is to appeal to these Reagan Democrats without challenging their racial beliefs and without really having too much to offer to the unions, uh, if they're working class union members, as many were in Macomb County, the Democrats didn't have very much forward motion uh, for the unions, and they had trade deals that the unions actually opposed. So to kind of aggrandize this middle class, white middle class, white working class constituency um, it becomes the, the way to overcome the trend toward uh, the Reagan Democrat. And uh, at first, Greenberg gets only so far with this, it's the period of the Rainbow Coalition, and people don't know quite how to discuss uh, these issues of race and class. But when his ideas are picked up in Bill Clinton's campaign in 1992, we really do begin to see the domination of, uh, middle, of appeals to the middle class without having to say white. And then more rarely sometimes, and now we hear appeals to the white working class as keys to the success of the democratic party it does uh right, well i just just i just wanted to like just h help people with the context in which that happens because we start to see 
starting with McGovern, you know, sort of this and, and, and coming out of the 60s, a slight rift between the Democratic Party and the and unions. And it expands over the course of that. And the and, and Jimmy Carter is somewhat hostile to unions. And that, of course, Reagan is. And the Democrats, instead of tacking back towards unions, continue sort of like to slide away from them. That happens through the 80s, although you've got... Uh, like you say, the, the Rainbow Coalition uh, and Jesse Jackson. And by the time you get to Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton is the uh, president of the DLC, which essentially is the organization that went out and made it their raison d'etre to become more corporate friendly, uh, a, a more corporate uh, friendly Democratic Party. So if I understand what you're saying about uh, Greenberg is that he found or thought that he had found a way to appeal to those Democrats who had left the Democratic Party during the realignment uh, during the Reagan years, and but was basically doing it on aesthetics on some level because there was no policies that the Democrats were pursuing that directly addressed the material needs of those people. But yet you could still be seen as listening to, in quotes, those people. And that's literally what he did. He went with pollsters to Macomb County and did this expensive focus group uh, polling, at first just with white men, Reagan voters, and then with some women, minority of, uh, of women. And he collected their worldviews. And some were said they were pro-union and thought that that was the way forward. But that wasn't what the book that comes out of this and the advice to Clinton that comes out of it, the book ends up being called Middle Class uh, Dreams. What it listens to instead is their grievances, especially uh, uh, mainly about black people. And one person says, I think to be middle class is to not be black and not live around black people. And so that kind of a, a, an ability to say, Yes, we're taking you seriously as a white working class person. And Macomb County was a county that almost doubled in size as white workers left Detroit after black government and the black rebellions of the late 60s came to the Detroit area. So they're often very, very aggrieved and embittered uh, people. And he said, yes, I hear you. Uh, and that's what we can do. And so issues like busing and welfare and mending affirmative action that became so central to the Clinton uh, presidency are uh, seen as responses to this white middle class and, and as listening to this uh, white middle class. Well, I, you mentioned Obama and Romney, and I just wanted to ask kind of you to expand on how that huge swath of Americans, whatever, 96% of Americans, like, Referring to them as middle class, it's kind of a stand-in for classlessness politics, right? Where you can essentially erase class divides and have a broader appeal, which I think is part of the 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 temporary strategy that plagues the Democratic Party to this day. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, and I, the great book on the middle class in the United States, C. Wright Mills's White Collar that came out right after um, World War II, you get right to the end of that book and he says, uh, and you think it's about the middle class, he uses these terms, old middle class, new middle class. And then at the very end, he says, now, of course, there's not any one middle, middle class in Marxist terms, sociological terms. These, this is a hodgepodge of, of people. And he specifically says, uh, and for that reason, you couldn't really politically mobilize a, a middle class. But what you can do with this 96% rhetoric is kind of make your appeals here and there and veil some kind of appeals that are more to race uh, than to class in terms of this broad unity. And we see it, you know, in, in among uh, progressives as well, there's a fair amount of a DSA, for example, that would that would say, um, let's just talk about the economic uh, issues, and that'll lift everybody. We don't really need to talk about race. Uh, Biden's uh, um, Sanders's 2016 uh, book for his presidential campaign had middle class in its title. Elizabeth Warren has written three books that have middle class in either the title or the or the subtitle. 
So this is a very broad kind of broadly successful kind of uh, strategy. And even those who kind of fight against it also fight within it to some extent. All right, can we, can we we expand on that? Because I just want to get. I mean, um, and I and I can't help but think, like you know, Sister Solja. I understand in a in a completely different context now um, that you know it, it, they were so interested in that sort of like Reagan Democrat that this was sort of a um, you know a signaling to like you know we're with you here. You know we're going to stop the excesses. But when you talk about um, uh, politicians who are deploying the term middle class as a way of because they know that it's a like a Rorschach test, and presumably, right? That um, that there it, it will um, activate sort of the, the 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 brains of of people who are somehow perceive the middle class as being like, you know, blacks are not going to have such a an important role in this on some level. I mean, um, what? what are they? Is this just simply uh, politicians of Avoiding dealing with this head on because they don't want to alienate certain portions of their potential electorate. Is that what's going on there? Well, let's go back to the sister soldier incident, because I think it's the perfect example of the kind of Greenberg uh, Clinton strategy and, and it has ongoing implications. Um, the, the incident, of course, was uh, uh, Clinton went to uh, an event organized by Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition and picked a fight with Jackson around the fact that uh, the event had seen a performance uh, by Sister Soldier. And uh, she had uh, made uh, comments about the LA rebellions that were dredged up as if she uh, condoned violence against uh, against white people, or understood that there would be violence against uh, against white people. Jackson's response when Clinton kind of out of the blue picks this fight is, he says, I, I had a feeling he was talking to somebody who wasn't in the room. And the, the push Rainbow Coalition crowd. And that's exactly right. He was talking to those people who were the objects of the focus groups in Macomb County because he knew that that would hit very, very, very hard among uh, those people. Uh, and so I, I think that, that, and we now know that it was Greenberg who made the suggestion that uh, it would be a good thing to go and pull this stunt with, with Sister Soldier. So I, I think that, that this is kind of how the strategy works. And it doesn't involve a frontal attack on the race politics of a Jesse Jackson. I mean, the Democratic Party is still massively beholden to a black uh, constituency. So it's not going to do that. And in that sense, I think still, even though we see some strategists, Greenberg lately, beginning to talk about the white working class instead of the middle class, I think middle class still is the best glue for the kind of coalition that they're trying to build. Interesting. Okay, so um, when we when we move forward, like where does let's talk about let's so we, we we come through uh, the Clinton administration. They're talking about and Obama, like you say, Obama and Romney both fighting over. 96% of the country, um, which, and I guess maybe Romney felt like he had that other 4% wrapped up, more or less. Uh, so yeah. might as well go for where. Well, then he arbitrarily narrowed it down to the 54% or whatever we, the case may be. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so let's let's jump up to sort of post-Obama. And, you know, there, there are myths about who Donald Trump activated in 2016. Um, that, I mean, I, 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 my contention was like, if you put the Romney, you know, you do the Venn diagram and you put the Romney voters and you put the Trump voters, more or less same people, although, uh, uh Trump managed to, you know, sort of build certainly in 2020, I mean, Biden did too. Um, and maybe we can talk about like, so what, what caused that, but, but Give us a sense of what actually happened with Trump in 2016, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this this supposed middle class. Well, I think that most of the postmortems on that election are where we started to see this turn to uh, talking about and blaming the white working class rather than the middle class. 
in the election itself, uh, both uh, uh, candidates uh, went after a middle class vote, and, and uh, Trump talked about middle class tax cuts. In 2020, he had to campaign on what the reality of those middle class uh, tax cuts uh, actually were. But I think that the Obama administration had kind of gotten discussion of the poor out of U.S. politics. And at one point, it was pointed out that this 96 percent figure means that you're including all of the people who are before the below the poverty line, which for some of the Obama administration was 20 percent of the of the population as middle class. And Obama uh, said a very interesting thing. He said, well, yes, I am doing that. Uh, when I talk about the middle class, I include the poor because the poor are just people who want to become uh, middle class. So the, the uh, statistical studies on class and presidential rhetoric show this massive shift from Lyndon Johnson, who talked about the poor all the time in connection with the war on poverty when he talked about class, to Obama, who doesn't hardly talk about uh, the poor at all. So you get Th that constituency out of U.S. politics. And it's arguable that in 2016, Hillary Clinton actually lost because of poorer turnout among some segments of the poor in some states than, a, than she did because of a middle class vote or um, um, anything else. So um, I think that, that uh, Trump's constituency is very much a uh, middle class constituency and an upper middle class constituency. It's tragic, of course, that a lot of poor white people, uh, working class people, uh, do uh, vote for reactionary uh, candidates. But uh, that tragedy shouldn't make us think that they're somehow the motor of all of this. Uh, most poor white working class people uh, don't vote. That that's still their their pattern. So, so did did the Democratic Party get away from? I mean, when you when you put it in those stark terms, and you go from uh, Johnson to Obama, and the amount that Johnson spoke about poverty versus Obama, I mean, it screams to me that the Democratic Party, and maybe they're afraid that the American people associate. You talk about poor people in the year 2008 or 2010 or 12 uh, or even 16 or 20. The, there's a sizable part of the American public that just hears black people. I mean, is that what's going on there? Is that why they avoid talking about poor people is because they are this is a it's so racialized on some level, the, the, the concept of who is poor? Well, I think that's definitely the case, including uh, programs that are race neutral programs, like when uh, uh, Clinton killed uh, aid to families with dependent children as a concession to the middle class dreams of white people. Uh, that wasn't a racialized program. That was a program that for most of its existence, whites had much more access uh, to it than black people. And then when it became more equal, Everybody thought of it as a as a, a black program. I think one reason we can't have universal uh, health care is that people associate any kind of uh, of uh, state benefit that somehow uh, black people are going to take advantage of that, or immigrant uh, immigrants of color are going to take advantage of that. And so I think it's very much a, a roadblock. Uh, not impossible to argue out, not impossible to, to say, well, that's actually not the case. These are universal uh, programs. But in the way that they're, um, that they not only go unchallenged sometimes by the Democratic Party historically, but in the Greenberg Clinton case, were somewhat forwarded by the Democratic Party. Uh, those connections, I think, are uh, ones that, that could only. Uh, be transcended with a challenge, not with a kind of fancy uh, uh, game that was played around it. Expand on what you mean by that in terms of like a, a challenge. I mean, it is, you know, when we see Sanders pushing universality and then also, you know, in the concept of the middle class, he seems to be sort of like, uh, you know, sort of sidestepping that issue on some level. Obviously, Warren, I mean, I'm not, 
I only s- single out Sanders because I think he's the most aggressive in trying to find that uh, universal health care. Um, yes. yes. But um, but w- so what would what would addressing that directly mean? Like, I mean, how how do you go about um, and not trying to sweep it under the rug and address it in a way that might be political effective in neutralizing this sort of like. Well, I mean, it's probably since 1965, right, that this has been growing. But the but both parties seem to have like um, uh, uh, failed to address it. The Republicans have no interest in addressing, but the Democrats seem to have like shied away from it for the past 30 years. Um, if they were going to change that, how would they do it? Well, I think that they that you would have to do it around uh, a conscious strategy to make class appeals or economic, people say, appeals and racial justice appeals at the same time and try to win people to the idea that uh, you that you can do two things at once and to win uh, poor whites to the idea that their interests are bound up with the interests of African-Americans. So to take the health care one, I think the Sanders strategy to date and the socialist strategy inside the the Democratic Party has been to say, let's just talk about its universality. Let's just talk about its universality. But people don't see it as a universal possibility. They see it as something that somehow Black people will gain advantage from. So unless you make that, unless you actually win people to appeals for racial justice, you're going to be vulnerable to even universal appeals are going to be uh, constantly vulnerable to this ideology that I talk about in the book. So um, you, you've got to you've got to do both at the, at the same time. I think so. I think it was a remarkable thing in the in the 90s that uh, how easily segments of the Democratic Party were able to say it's impossible to do both at the same time. And maybe they felt in pushing NAFTA and in uh, seeing that uh, corporate capital was only willing to go so far toward the unions, maybe they knew that they didn't have a a way to to say to white workers, here are the class things that you get, and it's in your interest to also support some of the things that Jesse Jackson is, is, is talking about. Maybe they truly thought they didn't have a way to do it. But the result has been this long period of rightward motion in U.S. politics. What is it about like former radical uh, lefties who become Democrats in terms of the way they we had John Judas on the program uh, recently. And I I just I keep hearing his uh, he admonished the Democrats for uh, a moment during the debates where they said, if you had Medicare for all, I I don't know exact question. Would you allow undocumented immigrants um, to uh, access it? And they all raised their hand. And he said, that's the death knell of everything right there. I mean, that to me sort of captures, right? That's the Greenberg or at least, you know, the Greenberg from the 90s, you know, on, you know, for the last into the aughts. That's the the theory, right? Like you're going to destroy the universality, the appeal of a universal program if you remind people that it's actually universal. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, that's literally Greenberg's uh, uh, take on things now in his book, Predicting the Death of the Republican Party. Uh, he says exactly that. He says, we, if we pass as sweeping a immigration reform as we did for civil rights, that would be the death knell of, it, of everything. We have to go slow on anything about immigrant immigrant rights. And, and so, but I mean, what, uh, uh, what, 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 what led to that? I mean, what, like, why is that seems to be the sort of like, um, I don't, I don't uh, you know, a virus that exists in 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 some uh, uh, elements of the Democratic uh, uh, leadership or or you know brain trust, as it were. Well, if you're talking about ex radicals, I think that some of them bring a, a kind of a oversimplified form of Marxism of historical materialism that itself is flattening of some of these uh, distinctions. They bring it with them. I, I think that Greenberg 
uh, for a long time in South Africa, still functioned as a radical. Uh, while he was doing this work for the Democratic Party in the United States, he was also polling for Mandela uh, in South Africa and strategizing and, and had much more left uh, positions. But I, I think that in both cases, he was saying at the end of the day, uh, we can't, it, it's not the race stuff that matters very much, it's the class stuff and not always realizing that you don't really get the class stuff unless race is, is also in there. Um, and so where do you anticipate, where, where would you rate Biden in, uh, on this scale? I mean, where, like, he doesn't seem to have, you know, Obama had, I think there was a sense amongst the Obama people that race is obviously, you know, like a, a third rail uh, because he's black. Um, I, I mean, there may have been other reasons, but certainly that was one that was articulated. Where do you think Biden falls on this spectrum? Well, I think he's very much a part of the uh, Greenberg uh, wing of the, of the of the Democratic Party. If there's a, a continuity from Clinton to Obama, it would then lead to Biden more than any of the rival candidates, certainly more than Sanders and and uh, and Warren. Um, yeah, I, I think he he's uh, he'll be hard pressed to do the things constitutionally in his gut. He'll be hard pressed to to take decisive steps toward racial justice, although maybe in the context of an electoral campaign, he will. Uh, I was very struck in this last 2020 campaign by the little bit of uh, traction that reparations got in Democratic debates, as long as it was just studying reparations or nodding toward uh, reparations. It was very much a kind of uh, acceptable issue to discuss, which to me was was fascinating. Um, and Biden was committed to that, and I don't really think uh, committed to it in practice. There's any evidence that he'll be committed to it in practice. Um, it is uh, interesting. And, and I guess, um, um, well, I guess we'll see what comes out of what, what's next after this. I mean, um, uh, but uh, it's a fascinating examination of, of the, the, the concept of the middle class. David Rodiger, uh, foundation professor of American studies at University of Kansas, author of Sinking Middle Class, Political history. Thanks for your, so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you both, Sam and Emma. Thank you. All right, folks, quick break. We'll be right back and land this baby. I like that one. We're back, just wrapping up things. A couple of uh, uh, breaking news. Uh, Lena Khan has been confirmed to the FTC. She will be one of the youngest commissioners in the FTC's history. She um, she is avowedly um, um, very strong on antitrust. In fact, the FTC is now a majority of... I don't know how to articulate it. Pro-aggressive antitrusters... For the first time in decades, um, it remains to be seen what the implications of that will be, because we also need to see what happens at the um, uh, what happens at the uh, DOJ. You can go back and listen to an interview we did with uh, Lena Khan back in 2014, June 18th, titled How Corporations Became People You Can't Sue. I thought we may have had her on actually twice. I'm not sure. Uh, but this is a big deal. And um, it is a good sign. Antitrust 
between the FTC and the DOJ. It's one of those things where, again, we've had many people on to talk about, we don't need new legislation. We just simply need a new regulatory framework in which we perceive, we uh, really, we just need to return to the old framework, pre-Ronald Reagan, pre-Robert Bork, on what constitutes a uh, antitrust violation. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Also, congrats to California and to New York. Uh, restrictions uh, lifting uh, soon in California. Vermont, yesterday, they are at 80% yes. vaccination. And Why New do they just do it better than the rest of us? New York State, uh, uh, over 70% uh, very shortly. Um, we, will, uh, we will keep you updated on both. Uh, and if you're watching us on Peacock, we will say sayonara. There you go. And see you tomorrow. And for those of you who are not watching us on Peacock or are watching us, you know, watching us live or uh, as a podcast or as a YouTube show, um, we're uh, we're still here and we're going to head into the fun half of the program. Do we know if they've got if uh, Nomi's got um, if Nomi's got uh, what do you call it yet? Uh, well, we can bring her on now and uh, ask her, actually. Internet. Looks like she does. Oh, good. All right. Majority Report wardrobe coordinator says, don't worry, Sam, you look super presentable. You're the best looking boomer on the streaming circuit. I uh, just want, I, I, I think you look presentable. <laughs> it was just a joke. And I felt bad. Yeah, about that well, that's not the problem with that comment. I'm not a boomer. Oh, right. You're like three years younger than being a boomer. Well, yes, I'm younger than a boomer. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Okay. Well ensconced in Generation X. Um, Nomi is connecting. Right now, apparently, uh, the internet is back on. We'll in, see. She's still uh, Just a reminder, it is your support that makes the show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. And if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe and like. If you're watching on, uh, uh, on Twitch, you know, it's poggers. I think you know that. And so... Uh, hype train 2000. Let's do this hype train. Let's get vroom, this revved vroom. up. That's Don't a make car. me get into... Um, don't make don't make Shutter me get Shutter. into a uh, hot tub and get this uh, channel. Uh, uh, you know what do you call it? Uh, not demonetized. What do they call it on Twitch? Put on an OnlyFans? No, no. There's you don't understand Twitch culture at all. It's really amazing. It's like, and they say I'm a boomer. What? Don't make me. Don't well, make I mean, me do that. You just have to bring out your Ken, Ken, and Ken uh, cut off. Cut off. I might do that. Sun's out, guns Sun's out, out. Guns out. Um, but uh, your your support makes this show possible. Go to jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, don't forget justcoffee.coop. Fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY to get 10% off. And uh, check out the AM Quickie, amquickie.com. You can watch it on our YouTube channel now, the, the main channel. And, of course, uh, always, always uh, welcome in the Discord at majoritydiscord.com. And look who's here. She has internet now. The internets. I do. I do. I have power. But be careful because you never know when they're going to change things up a little bit and just throw a wrench into your workday. Yeah, and by they, I mean the capitalists who bought the power grid. Right. Uh, yeah, you look like you're uh, um, uh, on dial-up a little bit. You know, I can't do anything at this point. <laughs> I'm just going to just use this as an opportunity to complain that uh you should privatization puerto rico i mean just like so people understand oh, yeah. why your wi-fi is this spotty yeah you're yeah, a demonstration of uh a, a privatization exactly privatization is coming to your neighborhood too um they just do it without any sort of oversight uh it's actually the opposite like they have democracy here and then they have a fiscal oversight board that's just like so cute your little democracy that you all are against the privatization of the power grid you're like but we're still gonna do it and we're gonna charge you for it Double, triple, quadruple. And yeah, meanwhile, meanwhile tax uh, breaks to everybody wants to come. And also, meanwhile, <laughs> Texas is saying, "Hey, can we just lay off the air conditioners for a while? Because uh, <laughs> turns out we're not so good at hot weather either with this new uh, ERCOT privatization scheme." Yeah, nothing like saying lay off the air conditioners when we're about to face record heat. Yeah, I mean, there's like all. I was reading this article in Gris the other day about how schools are now it's becoming more regular for heat days throughout mm. the country as Jesus. that is a climate change dystopian uh, concept for you well let's let's take this opportunity since we're talking about the heat 
Uh, and ERCOT, let's uh, pop up Ted uh, Ted Cruz's. It's uh, Ted Cruz tweet um, uh, Memorial Day. Oh, well, this is a treat for the pre fun half, folks. Yeah, this is it. Let's let's put up uh, Ted Cruz's um, uh, tweet and uh, and the accompanying video and the uh, oh yeah the the video. Let's hear it. Uh, you got it, uh, Brendan. Oh, the view on the video first or the tweet? Oh, sorry, I'm I'm. Well, here's the uh, I mixed up the Ted Cruz tweet. Here is the uh, here's the tweet. California now unable. This is back in uh, a little bit a little bit less than a year ago. Now unable to perform even basic functions of civilization like having reliable electricity. Uh, Biden Harris AOC want to make California's failed <laughs> energy policy the standard nationwide. Hope you don't like air conditioning. Well, let's just um, let's just uh, let's see if we can play this. This is uh, going to bury Ted Cruz's tweet. Yeah. I got uh, unconfirmed reports. On Memorial Day? These are unconfirmed reports, I just want to stress, but um, from my sources at the uh, Iceland airport that uh, Ted Cruz uh, just exited a plane in Iceland and he's uh, riding on some, uh, <laughs> you're going to go on some glaciers and cool this, uh, ride this one out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I, I had to. I had to bring my family there. They, they, they could, they couldn't sit in a house without air conditioning, and so I had to bring them in Iceland. And I'll be back. I'll be back right now. I'm, I, my whole plan was to fly right back. Ted Cruz, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Nomi, who's on your show today? Uh, we have Mike and Utrecht, and then later we have Ben Dixon and a political legend. It's gonna be a fun show. That sounds like a very fun show. Matt Leck, what's yes. happening in the Matt Leckian universe of media? Uh, yeah, so last night uh, for patrons, we had Jean Bajalan and John Graham. Jean Bajalan will be familiar to folks, but uh, both professors of history at Missouri State University to talk about the 1776 Commission, uh, which is a very scary document, which includes, which lists great reforms such as the civil rights movement, abolition, uh, and uh, anti-communism. So that's who we're dealing with on the right. So uh, check that out, patron, patreon.com slash left reckoning. All right, folks. 646-257-3920 is the number. See you in the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. 
Nazi. That guy might be a Nazi. Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Would you like me to sing for you guys? Because I can do that. You could put it on the... So much fun. You could put it on YouTube for your... We are back, ladies and gentlemen. We are back. Uh, it is the fun half. Emma is going to rejoin us in a second, and then we will um, we'll we'll get to um, the uh, that that video. Um, how is it going down there for you, Nomi? Uh, it seems like it's a little bit difficult. Uh, it's 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 been interesting. I mean, honestly, for the most part, other than the power going out, um, it's been really amazing to see uh just how much community is coming together to fight um i mean even from four years ago when i first started this documentary people were some people really understood what was happening on the island but now it's like everybody for the most part is pretty uh uh engaged in, in on one path or the other in terms are you are you pro selling the island off to billionaires or are you against it uh so you see a lot of like the diaspora coming back now and reinvesting in in the island people who left after maria people who have been a part of the diaspora because um, bottom line is, if you guys are curious what's happening, uh, I think it's pretty clear that they're doing all they can to get Puerto Ricans off the island and import billionaires who can um, set up shop here and not pay taxes. Unbelievable. Um, all right. That's it. Let's, uh, totally let's... believable. Yeah. Well, I guess it is. Um, so let me just preface this by saying I did not see this on, on Twitter at first. I got two different comedians sent this to me. Um, and, um, very successful comedians in their own right. Um, or in anybody's right, actually. And now you have to understand the mentality of, of, of comedians, um, I think, you know, particularly, uh, my, my, my friends are, are, are sensitive to, uh, all sorts of issues involving like misogyny and racism and whatnot. But one of the greatest offenses that you can do when you're a comedian is to be really unfunny and to perceive yourself as funny. That's the worst thing for someone who is dispositionally a comedian when someone is um, unfunny and thinks they're funny, that is like almost like that's like the most unforgivable crime. And so when I watched this, I was like, holy crap, that is misogynist and not funny. Uh, but here is a clip of uh, Demi Jor, who um, is this is what is so uh, insightful about this guy. He. Um, is incapable of realizing like he he presents this i think in such a way that he thinks it makes him look good um but uh here he is sort of bragging about the time that he um sexually harassed anna kasparian uh, yeah sexually harassed anna, anna he kasparian. thinks this makes him absolved it, it's it's bizarre uh here here it is uh demi jor on his own show Talking about uh, so yeah, appearance. Anna DM'd him privately after he's going off on her, you know, Assad puppet, whatever the you, you can keep going or keep that up there. And so it wasn't public. He decided to make it public, and then this is his like they were not going after him on the show. This is his own decision to put this information out there about his own behavior. <laughs> And I'll tell you this story. The story about uh, uh, that was followed by an apology card you wrote me for a degrading harassment. Uh, Anna Kasparian used to dress when I worked there uh, unbelievably inappropriately for a newsroom. <laughs> she looked like she was going to a rave. 
The skirt, one time she came into okay. the newsroom with a skirt so short. It wasn't a pencil skirt. It was like a fluffy one, too, but so I short can't. that she bent over in front of me, and I literally I saw her ass. I can't. And her thong. She's wearing a thong. I literally saw it. Everybody I can't, saw guys. It. This is too much. And I go, hey, Anna, nice news skirt. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody laughed like they laughed louder than I thought they would. And so it humiliated her. She got humiliated in the middle of the newsroom. And I did it. And I. Second. All right. I just there's a couple of things here about the construction of this. That I think is just sort of amazing. Everybody laughed. <laughs> everybody That's laughed. Brilliant. And they laughed because it was funny as opposed to like, wow, you just made. You just tried to humiliate her in front of a bunch of people. Emma has more to fill in on this story. Yeah. But you just tried to humiliate. You just attempted to humiliate her in front of a bunch of people. Maybe we're laughing because it's uncomfortable. And then he says she felt bad because she was humiliated as if he hadn't done it. As he, if it, No, he literally said, I humiliated her. He just said, I humiliated her. And he, he did he owned that? Yes, that was the last line he said. I humiliated her. Uh, that, push right. it, push it back a little bit. It sounds so passive. What he's saying, the passive voice here. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> laughed, like they laughed louder than I thought they would. So, and so it humiliated her. No, it, she got humiliated in the middle of the newsroom. And I did it, and I felt bad. No, I, I did I, it. At that time, we were friendly, and I was just busting her balls, right, for, oh, okay. for dressing like that. Is that newsroom. how you do that? Is that how it works, You're going to bend over and show me your ass? I think that's a little – I'm not offended, but I think that's a little risque. Um, oh, you're so conservative, Jimmy. So, yeah. so that's the thing, right? Like, one, if you were her actual friend, you would take her side – if you had that relationship, which I don't even think that would be appropriate in this instance and say like, hey, like, just so you know, but that's not even what happened, one. I mean, I spoke to Anna about this, like her underwear wasn't, like, I don't even want to get, what, what is so gross about this too is that Anna ha was a professor at a college. She had her students in studio their assignment was to watch the production of TYT. Right. So it wasn't just like the old boys club or like coworkers who have worked with Jimmy and Anna and there were friends and everyone was there together. He humiliated her or attempted to do so in front of her students. And of course she was embarrassed. Of course she was. And she wasn't even dressed in the way that he's saying, but he thinks that this makes it, you know, in some way absolves him. And this wasn't the only disgusting comment that he made to her. And it wasn't the only abusive way that he treated another employee at the company because I have had received messages from crew members. I've said this on the show before that he was degrading, abusive, whatever the case may be. And I've talked about it on the show and received messages saying, thank you for saying that on the show. I'm not gonna like speak about people's personal experiences that aren't my own, right? But this was part of what informed a lot of my viewpoint, also because I have two eyes and two ears, that so much of his commentary about Ocasio-Cortez was informed by misogyny. And I, I, I would have come to that opinion if I didn't have this background information as well. But this, this is exactly wh who this guy is. And the fact that he thinks this makes him look better just takes that up 200 notches. I think this is, but this is, when you say this is who he is, this is his business model. This is the business model of that little section on the internet. And we have to make it very clear. This was intentional. There's no excuse. I I'm not even gonna entertain his argument about what she wore. Who cares? Who cares? Bobby. He's a misogynist. He is using this opportunity to literally amp up his little misogynistic base because they're the ones who fight for him online. Every single move he makes is intentional about keeping his ratings going. And he knows that he and his little buddies and that little circular firing squad who love to go after progressive women or any women, that they make money off of misogyny. And I think that YouTube needs to crack down on that. I mean, it's like he also went after Francesca Fiorentini. Yes, no, we know, we know, we know. He's a misogynist, but it's got to stop. It's yeah. got to stop. It's like, uh, it's stunning to actually use 
uh, the, uh, she was dressed for it and was asking for it type of excuse. It's just almost like full-on parody in and of itself. Um, and I'm not frankly convinced or uh, unconvinced that the idea that she was, um, you know, sort of uh, showing the studio to her students wasn't part of like, you know, this guy's not in touch with anything that he's, you know, whatever, uh, you know, sort of like uh, he insanity no in his head. Right. Please. But I, I, I'm not convinced that that like his desire to humiliate her was not tied into the fact that she was in a position where she is like, you know, bringing students in. Well, she's in the position of power, right? Right, exactly. 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 So exactly. so let's bring that powerful woman down a notch. That's how I'm going to talk to uh, to Francesca Fiorentini in an abusive way. That's how I'm going to talk about Ocasio-Cortez and other women. And uh, it really just grates at him when there are women in positions of power that don't take shit. And this is how he chooses to put them down. It's textbook. And just because he liked Bernie Sanders at one time doesn't mean he has any progressive core values that are something to be espoused. I mean, the way that his fans are going after Anna and other women speaking out about this shows that this is not the same audience that we're speaking to here. This yes. is a separate, different right-wing audience. Yes. It's a lot of right-wingers who want to say, oh, I hear both sides, so I'm going to listen to this lefty Jimmy Dore, when everything about him just screams misogynistic, right-wing racial resentment towards Ocasio-Cortez, towards the squad. I mean, that's everything that's embedded in the way that he talks about politics. So, I mean, like, and it's not just, like, stupid YouTube drama, and I'm emotional about it because I love Anna, and I don't like it, 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 and I experience sexual harassment, too, in a very extreme way. But, like, it, it, it it's, it's important because he's completely disempowering a lot of his audience who could have leftist inclinations um, and turning them and red-pilling them, basically, and they don't even realize it. Um, and so if anybody watches that and still thinks Jimmy is, like, a, 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 good, a good guy, give me a break. Let's continue. Uh, I'll keep playing the video. There's, there's... Go ahead. Know me. Your ass, I think that's a little... I'm not offended, but I think that's a little risque. Um... Imagine if I did that, if I walked around <laughs> showing my ass to everybody. So uh, when she did, so when I did that, so she got really mad. She got, you know, she got uh, humiliated. Her face turned red. She tried to insult me back and it just fell flat and she looked, you know, bad. And I felt bad for her. I didn't I, I didn't want to make her feel that, but I just wanted to make a little joke. And um, all I said was, hey, Anna, nice new skirt. And everybody in the newsroom because everybody saw how inappropriate she dresses she used to dress and everybody saw it and uh so that's why it got such a huge laugh and she was so humiliated so i felt bad for her I mean, so the next day i wrote her a card saying hey i'm sorry i won't do that again pause it for one that was pause it for one second how excited he is about that joke he's repeating it four or five times everybody laughed i remember that time everybody laughed at the joke i made <laughs> you're, you're so like so... rightly offended by the uh, the complete well, unfunniness of of whatever this is but 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 it's no, tied up in his, yeah. his 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 incredible arrogance yes. i mean look, look listen there's a reason why jimmy is said you know like will not actually mention my name where has cut <laughs> out from interviews that he's done where people have referenced me has cut them out but yet will every time glenn greenwald says something critical about me will will like it and because he i humiliated him i didn't humiliate him by talking about like his you know bad die job at the time or any any of that stuff or his you know sort of loser career up until the point where he got on tyt None of that. I humiliated him because I showed that he didn't know what he was talking about, even though I had given him advance warning that I was doing it and invited him on and, and all that. And I humiliated him on the show so much so that, you know, he had invited me onto his show, but then privately said, like, no, I can't do it. And um, and, and for years. And that humiliation has lasted with him. Um, and so this is the, the way that he, he trades about it, but it is, you can see it embedded in here, his inability to say like, I did something wrong. Never 
articulates, I did something wrong. It's, I just made a joke that everybody thought was funny because she was so inappropriately dressed. And then she got humiliated and I felt bad because I was her friend and I saw her get humiliated. That's what you do. No, but first he says, first he says he was humili- she was humiliated and she was like essentially right to be humiliated. But I oh, was magnanimous, of course. Exactly. Like he's describing the actions you take if you watch someone else humiliate uh, them and you write like, I'm sorry you went through that and I feel bad I didn't say anything to that person. Right. Not if you're the perpetrator, you articulate that what you did, like he can't even articulate that what he did was wrong. He's just saying like, I, I just, yeah. too funny. But yeah. You got to it, Sam though. Like he is insecure about his comedy career and the low hanging fruit in his mind due, due to his misogyny that just has is 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 like what his worldview is right is to take it out on a woman rather than take it on you sam i mean anna has a huge audience francesca does i everybody deals with it in their own ways too i mean i give so much credit to anna for for speaking out and fighting back against this because you get punished as a result i don't engage with them anymore i'm even nervous about talking about it right now because it's not just that i lose followers you just get harassment all day long when you speak out if you acknowledge it so even this conversation, let me tell you, within five minutes, we're going to get this little round of people attacking us online. And so you have to go in consciously ready to defend yourself against misogyny. I didn't ask for it. She didn't ask for it. Francesca doesn't answer it. Neither does Emma. But yet we're all put in these positions to have to either choose to take it and ignore it or respond and get punished for it. And that's misogyny all because Jimmy Dore is insecure about his career in every way or form, and doesn't like to see, doesn't like to be challenged, doesn't like to be called out. Let me tell you what his game is. It's not just about, oh, she's wearing this, she's wearing that. The guy is an effing loser. If he makes his money off of putting people down and women down and saying he's in the movement, like you said, Emma, he just supported Bernie Sanders, and then he rode that wave because it was a good financial model, and now he's riding another wave to divide. Yeah. And so I'm not even saying to his viewers, be smarter. I am saying to YouTube, this guy is making money off of misogyny. You want to do something about your algorithm? Take that on. And, Take that on. And, and I, I will say this, too, is that the, there is no doubt in my mind that to the extent that there's any like blowback from people on Twitter or social media, that uh, you and you will get far more of it than I will. And despite the fact that this video does not exist unless I, if I have a problem with it. Like the reason why, like this is my show. This is not Nomi show. Uh, this is not, you know, I mean, it's Emma's the co but, 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 but if I was to say like, look, I'm absolutely there. not going to do this, but the, the, the proof in the pudding the tasting of the pudding, whatever it is, um, is is exactly what will happen following this. Is that there'll be, you know, like Jimmy will pretend like none of this had to do with me. Uh, all the water boys that come running in, you know, uh, in the circle jerk to uh, talk about this will 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 barely mention me. Um, and 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 these guys will get more of the abuse. C- continue to play. Yeah, the video. sorry about that. You don't have to worry about that happening again. I won't comment on your clothes anymore. I should have said no matter how fucking ridiculous. <laughs> you mean you'll stop commenting on her thong? On her thong <laughs> that I could see. Max, where, where would you like to take the conversation? <laughs> Oh, look who it is. Yeah, well, uh, well let's, let's, so I mean, Max later, like, essentially was like, I feel uncomfortable with that. So bare minimum. Yeah, I, I would imagine it was clear that, 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 uh, you know, he's, he's more interested in calling her a CIA agent. Let's be real. Well, like everybody's got their role in tearing down Anna Kasparian. I, I mean, Blumenthal, I she's think a CIA agent. Even, right. even Max was like, uh, I don't think I want to be a part of you uh, justifying this because uh, she decided to, you know, what her underwear choice was. Like, but again, that's intentional, Sam. It's not It's not like they had their little circle. Everybody's got their role. You want to make people anti-imperialist, you know, tap into the to the uh, the, the right wing misogyny, the the like libertarian left uh, bros. OK, Jimmy is a great, uh, you know, he's 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 what is it called? The, the, the welcoming crew. And then you end up in gray zone land where, OK, they don't do uh, outright misogyny, but they do target a lot of women and call them like 
uh, CIA agents, uh, NATO, whatever the hell they do. Um, you know, imperialists, they're just part of, you know, they're not really feminists, they're bombing women. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that his, like, he hands it off to him and then he takes it in another direction. So it's an ecosystem. It's yeah. Intentional. And, and there's like a, a, a complicity with some uh, people on the left who have a lot of massive platforms who don't really call this stuff out or think it's like, you know, in their interest to call it out. And I will say, like, one, it's incredibly brave, as I say, of Anna to take this on and to say this personal story because, one, it's like responding to a victim blaming narrative where you're going to have some percentage of men who are like, well, did she really dress like that? Like, she, pr you know, she shouldn't, right? I believe, like, someone would even articulate that. Well, in Jimmy just did. And no, his I know. Know, and his audience is like mostly male of course that's the case and and i just want to emphasize that you know anna has a has a significant platform i have a platform and i don't really you know like i i was afraid of getting sued so i didn't speak out and i still am to this day right so like i it, 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 one, I'm just emphasizing the courage it takes to, to speak out and tell your story and also to say that there were other people that he offended in this way and was abusive towards who don't have that same platform, who are really good people that I've worked with and I adore. And I feel really sad that, you know, that it has this chilling effect because it, Anna is a public f person and you know, they're going to see how the res what the response is to her. And, you know, hopefully this does move the needle. I do think her her commenting on this does and why it was really so awesome. But um, but but there are a lot of people who won't get, you know, recognition who who he wasn't kind towards um, and it, it, to say the very least. So I just wanted to make, make that clear. All right, uh, let's go on to the phones. Calling from a 308 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Why might not I be able to hear him? Let's try another one here. Calling from a 502 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, can you all hear me? Yep, well, I can hear you. What's going on? Who's this? All right. Hey, uh, I'm Will from Indiana. Will from Indiana. What's on your mind? Uh, well, actually, uh, I was going to do some sort of like funny phone call, like a whole making fun of Tom McDonald thing and then like spicing, you know, other people in there as well. But I think with the current subject, I think it's probably best to like talk about that for now. Sure. Uh, yeah. Whew, yeah, it, um, the amount of, uh, Jimmy Dore, man, he's scum. I, I really just like, I, I, yeah, it, um, I'm kind of at a loss for words right now, honestly. Uh, cause I mean, I think I like, I love Anna too. I think she's an awesome human being. And I think, you know, you know, she is very brave. I agree. She's very brave for speaking out about this. And, uh, it, cause it's, it's going to get a lot of, you know, hatred from a lot of people in his audience, a lot of men in his audience. Um, you know, I just, I, and I also think that, you know, with Emma, no, no, me, no, me key. And, you know, just for you all saying your parts about this and, you know, you all are nail it every single time. I mean, I, I just think that a lot of people who are defending him are, um, just subject to a lot of, a lot of his own, you know, I guess I would relate it back to like the whole, I mean, this is anecdotal, but like they would rather talk about like, Oh, well, Jimmy Dore, you know, he supported Bernie and he's, you know, for the force to vote for Medicare for all. And so he's good. It's all about policy. It's not about, I don't care that he said this uh, very nasty thing about Anna Kasparian. He's, he's good. He's, he's all good. Cause you know, we agree on, They'll use that as a facade, basically. We're and giving him too much credit when we do that, also. He supported Tulsi Gabbard in the primary. Like, he t supported Bernie Sanders in 2016. Right. I mean, he his yeah. support was a function of who would come on his show. I mean, that's basically it. I mean, he was, you know, sort of uh, Ed Schultzian in that way. I mean, it was really just a function of, like, you know, I mean, it, 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 it it's just, it, it's him being a celebrity. And then on top of that, he's, he's got this uh, misogyny issue as, as, as others. But appreciate the phone call. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for taking it. Thanks, Will. Uh, let's go to 
Calling from a 561 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, my name is Thomas Carney. Um, I have a YouTube channel called Blue Orange 22. I've been watching uh, some of your episodes recently, and uh, some of your uh, viewers have advised me to call in. I am okay. a men's rights activist. You're a uh, men's rights activist? I'm a of several men's rights groups. Okay. And I feel like the men's rights movement is very much understood. Uh, sorry, misunderstood. Misunderstood. Uh, I've called in C-SPAN before. I've written articles before. Okay. And it's a fun hour, so let's just talk. Okay. So what would your perception, if someone told you they were a men's rights activist, what would your perception be? Like, how would you see that right. first, first, first gut reaction? My first gut reaction? Do you want me to be totally honest? Of course. I, I think you're a lunatic. Okay. So you say lunatic. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean that, you, you asked me to be honest, and I wasn't going to disrespect you by not being honest. So that was my first absolutely. thought was like— I would, I would ask for nothing less than the truth, and that's absolutely fine. I get that reaction all the time, and I understand why that's your reaction. Right. I see all these articles that are equating the men's rights movement to, like, the alt-right, to, like, incels, to misogynists. And what I'm trying to get across is that that is not what the men's rights movement is actually about. Ah. And well, why don't you tell us what the men's rights movement is actually about? Okay, I would say there are both legal and social disparities that affect men and boys around the world. So okay. both instances of legal discrimination that hurt men and boys and different social standards and double standards that affect men and boys. And we would like to bring attention to these disparities and discriminations. Okay both legislatively to fix the laws and make them equal mm -hmm. and socially to get people kind of talking about it. Hey, you know what? I've noticed this is true. This is a double standard that affects men. Right. How come when a guy gets to call his girlfriend, people think it's funny, et cetera. Okay. Now let me ask you this, um, because I, I'm sure you have a, a long litany of, um, of, of legal dis disparities that you're aware of um, and uh, of, of social slights, like how come people think it's funny when a guy gets uh, dumped by his girlfriend, but not when a girlfriend gets dumped by his guy? I mean, like, I don't, I don't know I how to measure that. I think he means hit. hit. Oh, no. Oh, hit. Yeah. Hit. I was okay. 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 Oh, hit, hit, hit. Okay. I, I, d I will say for the record, I do not think either is funny. Okay. But, 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 but fair enough. Let's, I mean, let me just stipulate some of those things without even hearing them. What, at the end of the day, is the net implications of this? I think, and this has been backed by uh, studies of human psychology, there is a tendency, a subconscious tendency, to show less empathy towards a male than a female. And they demonstrated this with a study where they offered participants money to give electric shocks to a random stranger. And the shocks would increase in pain with each time. Now, of course, they weren't real shocks, and it was just, it was just, they were just told that. But people were more willing to hurt a man than a woman. Both men and women were both more willing to hurt a man than a woman. And I think people have a blind spot when it comes to male issues because the narrative is that men are privileged. But this is not now. Now, when you talk about the psychology of people having less empathy for men and I can I can um, I, that doesn't I mean, I, I, I haven't seen those studies, but it's not that doesn't seem completely um, uh, it's not hard for me to imagine um, what does that have to do with rights? Well, for example, in a lot of countries, the state pension age is higher for men than for women. Is that, is that in this, in, it's not in this country. No, in this country, we okay. have like, well, let's just keep it. Let's just keep it within the United States yeah, well, because no. I don't, because I don't know. So I, I also know. I mean, I mean, can we agree that there's also probably more countries around the world that are not the United States where women have far less rights than men, that even if you can find countries where the pension age... I would absolutely for, agree. Okay, so let's just, is, let's just keep... Not against, hold on, can you let me finish? Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. You got your own YouTube show, right? I do. Okay, so if you want to random, throw out random stuff like this, you can do that on your show. But I just want to ask, I want to try and just, you know, sort of like, because I don't... I, I am quite sure, although I cannot list it, and I want to be clear on that, that if we were to survey the laws around the world, that women have far less rights around the world as a net than men. And if you have to go to the pension age for men, as like you're, if, that's your, if, you're, if that's your top line, 
I, I feel very confident in saying that because well, uh, no, we, we have a lot of countries where women can't even it's drive. It's because women but, live longer. That's why the pension age, right? But 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 put that aside for a moment. Put that aside for a moment. But hang on. Um, uh, can we just stay? Can we just it, stay it, it, in the United States so that we can have on, this conversation? I want to ask what Emma just said. Emma just said it's because women live longer. Now, I don't think that pension ages should be different based on gender. But if anything, if one was to make a logical argument based on how... Correct. The pension age would be shorter. Okay, lower. Now listen to me. Listen, dude. Dude, no. You hang on. I don't want to talk about the pension age in some random country somewhere else. I want you to explain to me how... Listen, stop talking for a second and let me finish. I want to talk about what rights have to do with the fact that there's a psychological study that show that people are less empathetic to men. What rights do you think that men are denied and what material difference do you think that that lack of empathy provides in the United States that allows me to believe that my energy should go into making sure that men have uh, equal rights as opposed to the people who have you know, only recently had the right to have a credit card in their name, or only recently had the right to vote, et cetera, et cetera. In the United States, exclusively. Yeah. Okay. So let's stay with the U.S. And first of all, uh, I know what you're saying about women not having a credit card until 1973, but at the same time, 18, 19, 20-year-old boys in 1973 and before were being drafted to die in Vietnam. Which right. Is and I think uh, you'll find that but people let's advocated let's for... Let's say to today. In the U.S. today, for example, Obamacare allows for an annual women's wellness visit, which is an annual physical for general health. Men... Oh, my God. Thank God. Men pay for insurance for Obamacare. They do not get the same health care I... under Obamacare that women will get. Prostate cancer screening is also not covered under Obamacare. Prostate cancer is the cancer a non-smoking man is most likely to die from. The only cancer that kills more men than prostate cancer. Dude, is when, do get, when do you get it? When do you get? When do you get prostate? When do you get prostate cancer? I'm sorry. When do you get prostate cancer? When is I the? What is the age in which you people. need to worry but about prostate cancer? More men die of prostate cancer. I understand. Age. What is the age? What is the age? What is the age I will get prostate cancer? What is the age when men contract prostate cancer? It is the it is the cancer that No, no, I didn't ask you what the age is. I didn't ask you what the cancer is. I know what prostate cancer is. I'm asking you, at what age do you think you're most vulnerable that that you really need the screening? 60 and above. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Medicare? Yes. Okay. Obamacare, the ACA Deals with people who get up to the age of Medicare. But not everybody is over the age of 60 when they get prostate cancer. No, I understand that. But you also don't, you're not getting, you're not getting, um, you're not getting mammograms if you're a 25 year old woman on Obamacare. But a 25 woman can get breast cancer and die. It's not about breast cancer. <laughs> Women are going to the OBGYN for the birth of children and for reproductive health. Men cannot carry Point babies. Point is the health needs. The point well, is the health needs. Babies. But a 55-year-old man can still develop advanced stage prostate cancer, but he would not have screening available. I understand. Obamacare. But, dude, do you understand that the way that they determine these things is not a function of, of, of the possibility. It is the function of the likelihood. What you're complaining about is public health so what's policy. What's the difference between the possibility also, and the likelihood? No, I'm sorry. Women spend, on average, from ages 19 to 35, $3,400 a year on health care. How much do you think men spend? What's the relevance in how the law's written? Nineteen hundred dollars because Obamacare is the meant to lower the cost of health care. It's the basis for how the law is written. It's the complete basis. What's the difference between possibility and likelihood? Likelihood measures um, the uh, the percentage of 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 chance of you getting it. Possibility simply says any chance above zero. Right, but. If you have a law written based on the likelihood and the possibility, if you have two genders that have an equal... No, no, not likelihood and possibility, dude. It is written on the basis of likelihood. Okay. Are you advocating for Medicare for all? 
The well solves your problem. What I would like to know is where is this coming from? Why are you like on this crusade? What is it in your heart that makes it that like out of all the crises that we're facing in this country, you really think that there's some men that just are not getting the fair shake? Like where is this coming from, dude? Not, first of all, it's not some men. It's virtually all men and boys. And where it comes from is we get- I would agree with that. Yeah, virtually all men and boys have issues with women. Yes, I would agree with you on that. You want me to talk or not talk? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hang on a second. Would you like the floor again? Please take the floor. I've said four words. We get messages from 13, 14, 15 year old boys who are scared. Things they hear in school, things they hear from their parents. Things they hear I'll be back, guys. I'm going to go throw up. You're going to throw up? No, no. Go ahead. You get, you get, you get messages okay. from 13, 14, 15 year old boys who are scared. Yes. And they hear the rhetoric that is being taught in school. They're being taught men are bad, boys are bad, toxic masculinity, and they're being lectured. Wait, 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 wait. And they're you, are you telling are me that there are schools that say oh, men are bad and boys are bad? Toxic masculinity is bad. Well, toxic masculinity and, is toxic. But instead of lecturing them, why not listening to where they're coming from? Instead of lecturing, this is why your masculinity is toxic, why not ask them instead, Hey, Why dude, you you're playing games here person? because nobody's saying is. masculinity <laughs> is toxic. There is a, are you denying the existence of a masculinity that is problematic? I'm saying that it's not up for feminists to just define. I'm not talking about feminists anything. Who said feminists? I'm asking you a question. Do you think there's any aspects of masculinity that are toxic? No, I think there are aspects of the social expectations on men that are toxic. And toxic. Just the expectations. Right? Nothing that men do, nothing that men have been, have been socialized to do over the years in creating what we know as masculinity is in any way toxic. Of course, look at the draft. Look at conscription. Oh my God, dude. Dude, right. dude you're not Look listening to what I'm saying. What is ma- the Explain to me. doesn't exist. What is masculinity? Anymore. Uh, one at a time, please. What is masculinity? Emma, shut up. In other words, Emma, Emma, please stop talking. Please, be, we need to give the floor back to the, the, the man who thinks that masculinity is under attack. What? One at a time. What is masculinity? I would say that masculinity is defined as the social conventions that someone would expect of someone who appears to be man. Expect? But I don't wait, 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 wait. So you don't have masculinity. I impose it on you. Is that what you're saying? I did not say that, no. Well, if you're telling me that the definition of masculinity is what other people expect, you're saying it has nothing to do with you, that you don't have masculinity. I impose it on you. That's my expectation. Sounds nothing like you're gender fluid. You, I didn't say no, not me personally, <laughs> society. You're saying expectations. Does masculinity exist except for in the expectations of other people? Society as a whole, yes. I didn't say from you. No, no, I understand society as a whole. Do, can masculinity exist without the expectations of others? Yes. Okay, what is it? I think that if you took a million men and a million women under the Thanks. same circumstances and you followed them over 10 years, you would see there are certain trends and certain hobbies and certain interests that men would be more likely to be interested in. What is it? What? Interested. What? It doesn't mean that you're defined and it doesn't mean that you're locked into these roles. It doesn't mean that a woman can't play football and a man can't wear makeup. Those she, things are totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. What you. it means is that there are some innate differences. Dude, are you telling me you're a men's rights activist and you can't even define for me what the word masculinity means? Masculinity is, a, is, is, is not a scientifically defined term. So no. A social construct is what you're saying? It's a social construct, and there's nothing it's about that concept. social it's construct that is in any way toxic. If you ask 10 different people, you get 10 different answers. So I yeah, but that's not how this works. If you're going to use this as your basis and your argument, you have to actually provide some sort of evidence. Now, like, you know, I'm really curious because on one hand, you're talking about the economy and how it affects men. But if you're going to go on that, let's talk about how it affects women. Let's just talk about that. Or are you talking about the social construct, which is based on the 10 people that you have in a room who have an opinion? Nothing on the pay gap, by the way, dude. You're talking about pension funds. In interested what you think about the pay gap for men and women. 
Okay, well, first of all, I'm going to go back to what Sam was saying, how as a man's rights activist... I, I, I'm, and that, that doesn't shock me. Community. As a man's rights activist, I wouldn't want to define masculinity. Secondly, as for the pay gap, men under 40 now earn less than women in the United States. Men are fundamentally false, dude. Fundamentally false. You know, do you know who were the frontline, the majority of frontline workers were this last year that we all praised frontline workers? There are women of color, ma mainly women of color. And I don't see you going to bat for the $15 minimum wage. You want to talk about gender equity? You want to talk about men's rights? Then fine, go make sure that women make more money so that you don't have to feel insecure about taking care of the family and the home. If you're so burdened by this, then why don't you advocate for, for, for pay equity, a higher minimum wage? Let's talk about all the institutional issues that will make you feel more empowered as a man to have a little extra money to go out there and spend on whatever you do in your men's rights movement. You want equity? Fine. Let's do it. Sounds great. Because I don't. All right. So wait a second. So, okay. So let's just be clear. Let me, let me just like catch up where we are here. There's no, there's no way to define masculinity. So uh, any talk of toxic masculinity, of course, is absurd because we don't even know what masculinity is. Uh, but toxic, term, yeah. and, there, and, there, and, and, and so there can't be toxic masculinity because we don't even know what masculinity is. Um, and that's impossible to define. Um, the, well, that's not what I said. I said there is a general sense of masculinity based on the tell me what it is you keep talking around it don't tell me there's a general sense i'm asking you what it is and you can't articulate it so how is there a general sense <laughs> because there's no specific definition as you said there is no specific well here let me tell you what toxic let me tell you what toxic masculinity involves it involves uh things that uh, uh end up uh leading to domestic abuse Yes, it's not funny when uh, men get hit, but the fact of the matter is the overwhelming amount of domestic abuse in this country is men on women, right? That's can... the very, uh, that is very much debatable. Well, okay, debate it. Oh, boy. There are statistics that show oh. very, very, very wildly different rates of domestic violence where some studies So say are you telling me, 50, sir, 50, who is calling in, that the domestic that's violence that's rates that's uh, that, that don't, don't, don't that's tell me there's a debate, debate to be had. Answer it. I don't want, answer it. Answer the question. Do men beat women more than women beat men? You tell me, men's right advocate. I would say that first of all, the studies are inconclusive. And secondly, it we don't know because you we can't know. That, we don't you know. We don't know. OK, so we don't, I, 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 I want to done we don't know, say know say what the rates of domestic abuse are because they're minority. Hang on a second, though. What I would like to know, that doesn't mean based on your presumption that, that men and women, we don't know what the actual numbers are. One thing we do have really good sense of the numbers are is how many women end up unhoused because or are stuck in, in, in domestic abuse situations because of the pay equity issue in which they cannot leave their home with their partner in a domestic abuse situation because their partner is part of, of, of you know, they have, to take care of their, they have to take care of their children, their home. And if you separate from a domestic abuse situation, you're put in an unhoused, possibly even more vulnerable situation. We do know the numbers on that and they're majority women. First of all, okay, but, but first of all, do you think it's possible that because male victims are taken less seriously and they don't get as much help and they don't have a shelter to go to, that the number of unhoused men is lower? No, I don't actually, because there's a pay equity issue in which men make more money than women. That's not true. Okay, so let me let's just be here. Let's be. I, I just want to now. I want to sum it up because obviously there's nothing. Nothing seems to be knowable here. Uh, we don't know what domestic rates of violence are. We don't know what the word masculinity means. Um, we also uh, we we don't know what the pay disparities are. All we know is that 13, 14, 15 year old boys are writing into you saying that people are telling them men are bad and boys are bad. Uh, That's not what I said, Sam. That's not, that is not being honest at all, and you know it. And we do know, so and by the way, we do know the pay gap statistics. When you control for all factors, such as working overtime, men and women earn almost identical salaries in the United States. Now, if you take the median male salary. But why, why would you control for working overtime? Why wouldn't you? Because you're talking about the opportunity to make money. 
But women have the same opportunity to work overtime. No, they don't because they have kids. <laughs> Men have kids too. Uh, are you telling me that we can't know who has primary uh, responsibility in our society as exists now for, for taking care of the kids? Well, of course, it's true that women are given uh, custody more than men. But if you have a couple, they can Free absolutely up. decide, hey, listen, I'm going to work more tonight. You work more tomorrow night. That's the choice they can make. Now, do you think That's it's a rational decision uh, that uh, do you think it's possible that that society rewards uh, men more than women so that uh, if you're uh, economically strapped, there might be more opportunity for men to make money than women? No, you don't think that exists. Oh, interesting. No, I, don't. I mean, look, I, you know, listen, you're living in a, uh, a different universe. You're um, honestly living in a different universe. Then be, 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 let me tell you why. Let me tell you why so many people respond to you. Listen to me. Listen to me for a second. Let me let me let me let me let me suggest something to you. Let me suggest something to you because we're going to have to end this at the moment. But I would love you to call back in. Has it occurred to you that the reason why you when you portray yourself and, uh, you know, when you go out and you go on CNN or whatever it is that you, you, you had mentioned in your in your preface, Please you ban. do that people respond to you like I do, like you're a lunatic, that the reason why they're doing that is because everything you're saying, not everything, but the vast majority of what you're saying completely does not comport with their sense of reality. So we've got that type of situation where, like, you have one sense of reality and everybody else around you, not everybody, but the vast majority of people around you have another sense of reality. And yeah, a lot of people like you have a misunderstanding of, 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 of like, yeah, would, of things like that. the dynamic that exists in the workforce or the dynamic that it works, that exists with domestic abuse or just the concept of like, hey, People didn't have the right to vote, you know, up until, uh, uh, you know, fairly recently in our in our society or didn't have the right to have their own credit card or couldn't even have the right to have their own name. I, I lived know. in a city when I was 21 in my city, in the second biggest city in New England. Women were not allowed to register to vote under their maiden name. But that doesn't invalidate the men's rights issue. Like no, what it suggests idea. to me but is, not, look, listen, you can country. find subsets but of all country. sorts of people who don't have in certain specific areas uh, the same. I, I mean, I'm not quite, quite convinced that, that, that men don't have the same rights, but um, but the don't well, have equity. You, I, 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 but I can know, tell you that across I, society, I when you so. look at I'm not interrupting you because I haven't stopped talking. When you look nonstop. across society, the net, the net relationship in terms of rights in society and be able to move to society with some form of equity, I'm sure if you try, you can find some, uh, some narrow instances. And I have no doubt that we have not done a good a job of trying to change the expectations of, of what we expect out of men. That has to happen. There's no yeah. work harder, be smarter, because guess what? We're not handing it to you on a platter anymore. If you're the of rights, uh, it's not what I said. It's not a question I, of I, rights. It's not about being handed on a um, It's or not a question of rights. Grades for the same work at every age and every subject. Just so you know. Could it possibly be? I have a theory about people like you, and I don't worry about offending you because you just spent the last twenty minutes basically offending uh, everything that both Emma and I have been talking about for the last. Yeah. I don't know. Hang on, hang on, hang on a second. I know. I have a theory about you. You're not the kind of person that would offend me because your opinion of me is not a reflection of myself. And that is, I'm so happy you have that self-confidence. I'm so happy that you just walk through the world thinking that your opinion matters more than everybody else's. But guess what? It seems like you're a little insecure about, I don't know, maybe you have to put in a few more hours and do a little extra work because now immigrants and people of color and women are suddenly outpacing you. There's 10 seats at the table, and I'm sorry, you were the 10th, and now you feel insecure because you don't just get that spot. I never said that. Never. No, I know you didn't say that. That's my theory on you. Um, this reminds me of this one time, and just to give you a little story, I remember, and, and Sam, you'll appreciate this, I was sitting in a conference room with Ron Hartenbaum and uh, his partner uh, talking about a Sirius XM show, and out of their mouths, these six-year-olds said to me in their 60s, said, 
Nomi, we really wanted a woman and we're really happy that we chose you because you don't have kids and we knew that you would be able to do this job three hours a day and put in the extra work needed because you're still young enough that you don't have kids, but we needed a woman to host the show. Out of their mouths, that is what they said. Do you see what's wrong with that statement? Do you have a sense of that? Nakomi, is that what I said? No, that's not my name. I'm sorry. Can you try that again? Well, wait, that's, your name is uh, what? That's, I'm looking that's at your, I'm looking that's, at that's, right now. Like, what is your name? Are you, is this um, okay. He can't see. He can't see. No, it's not. It's okay. It's, it's okay. He's calling into the show because he's a regular viewer. So I'm curious if he was going to do the extra work that people do when they call into shows when they want to debate somebody. Did you do the work? Or you just want to hand it to you? Hand it to you? Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Teenage boys and men. I listen, I'm gonna as a professional feminist, I'm gonna give you a little advice now. If you're gonna call into a show and debate right. men's rights, maybe come a little bit prepared. Maybe the issue is is that you've just been able to skirt through life just saying, like, some people say, and this is my theory. Come in with the facts next time. We'll be ready for you. But in the meantime, I know you're insecure about not being able to just walk into life and get what you want and actually have to do the work now. And you wouldn't listen. All right. So Thomas, uh listen. And deflect and hold the point. Sam, can I talk to you one-on-one? -on -one? Yes, uh, at another time. Okay. I would like to arrange. Not now. I would like to arrange. <laughs> can I have a one-on-one -on -one men's rights conversation with you, Sam? Man. Watch this out. Mano y mano. <laughs> mano y mano. Like <laughs> or, you know, it's fine. <laughs> MS can come too. Oh, 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 thank you. Oh, come on. As long as you're quiet, you can come. <laughs> it's because I'm cool and I drink beer. With timed responses. We, oh, with timed yeah. responses. You have 90 seconds. And I had nine. Well, I'll tell you what, Thomas. Why don't you have me on your show? You want to come on my, on, my, on my channel? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, great. But send send me an email, majorityreporters at gmail.com. I just want to debate a woman. I'm really curious. This, I'm, I'm just really curious about this whole scenario here. Why don't you want to debate a woman one-on-one? Yeah. -on -one? No, we got to let him go. Yeah, I got to let you go, he, I was absolutely He's dead already. Oh, he'll do I, it. I, I, did say, I did say Emma can come. But correct me if I'm wrong, Sam is the name of the channel. It's called The Majority Report with Sam Sater. Is that true or false? Sam Sater, yes. Sater. Right. <laughs> he did his research. Thomas, uh, send me an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. We're going to have some fun, buddy. I already have. Oh, well, hmm. very Last good. Week. Very good. Very good. Goodbye. I'll give, you the special, I'll give you the special men's rate, too, when I come on. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> right, but thanks. Sam. Yeah. Oh, God. That was good. Sorry, folks. I want to I want to issue an apology. <laughs> Emma's a 30-minute conversation with a fedora. Yep. Uh, I want to I want to issue an apology uh, to Emma and to uh, Nomi and to our entire audience. No, don't you mean no 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 Kimi? No, no, no. I'm the last person who's going to be able to who's going to be able to sort of judge somebody for being able to pronounce. Uh... It's okay. It's our thing, Sam. It's not like. <laughs> um. All right, uh, should we move on? Yeah, yeah sure. We, you know, uh, I'm okay. Let's keep talking about this. I'd love to. <laughs> wow, I mean, that was like a whole hour of the fuck off on Jimmy Dore and then men's rights. I know. I apologize, folks. I'm so sorry. Oh, man. What a day. I am so sorry. Um, let, we, we got a bunch of clips here I wanted to get to. Um, and, uh, um, well, let's go with the uh, Fox and Friends. Uh, they're... You know, it, it is as long as we're talking about people who are indignant about what's being taught in schools. Um, mm -hmm. On one hand, we just heard from somebody who said that uh, 12, 13, 14 year old boys are being told that men are bad and that toxic masculinity is bad. Um, sort of built into the definition. Tox, toxic. Yeah. But um, and uh, maybe it doesn't quite get that, but that's all right. Here is uh, Fox and Friends weekend. We have uh, Will Kane, uh, Rachel Campos, Duffy and Pete Hegseth. And God, they're just like, it's amazing how, how pernicious this critical race studies is. It's just like everywhere now. <laughs> I'm really taken aback by how arrogant these local school board members are in this little world of power, this tiny little purchase of real estate they've gotten to wield power over their fellow community members. And we've seen this time and again, how condescending they are to any citizen that steps up yeah. with concern over the education of their mm -hmm. children. I'm 
really taken aback by the level of arrogance of local school board members. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a debate. Right, <laughs> and local schools are funded by the local community. But it is a really great reminder that we focus, a lot of us Americans, on you know the congressional race and the Senate race. They seem a little more sexy to us. But the real action right now in America is happening at the local level. And if you remember, Obama last week said, you know, oh, he laughed off critical race theory and all the things that are mm -hmm. happening at school. And he, he, you're over the target. If Obama says, don't pay attention to this, this is nothing, then exactly you, you, you should exactly where to. you should be focused. That's so right. parents are on track. And they're fighting back. They've, they've <laughs> launched a petition at change.org. Here's a portion of the petition in that school district. Jen Fano and all of the Board of Education members have disgraced our community and clearly Good. do not have the best interests of our children in anything they do. They represent everything that is wrong in education and are completely incompetent in every aspect of their role. I presume they're correct. Then you got to vote them out. Yeah. I mean, they, well, they're, they're trying to get them to resign. They got, right trying now. to get them to resign, <laughs> and maybe that will work. Hopefully, right. that level of public pressure will work. But to your point, Will, they feel insulated behind their podium and their microphones. Yes. They can cut everybody off. And all the incentives from the NEA to the teachers' unions, even the PTAs, which are captured today, are to go woke, oh, go in that direction. That's the easiest path until the public is exposed to the fact that Thanksgiving is gone. It's now holiday day off number 14. It's so, so bad. It's so crazy. It's, it's, it's Take it's a so moment insane. and step back. For, you're telling me we have to go to day 34, not Thanksgiving. Yes. That's, not Thanksgiving, I mean, not Memorial Day. By the way, you know, <laughs> if they are a small, the people demanding this are a small minority. That's right. And they don't want to hurt people's, those people's feelings. But what about all of our feelings? Like, does anybody care about no. us? Do we care enough to protect our history? That's right. And our traditions. Good and that's yeah. what's It's a cultural oh, revolution. There we go. Mistake. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. That it's absolutely. Are they trying to cancel teachers? They're trying to cancel teachers. Trying to cancel PTA members. Um, oh, yeah. They're starting the war on Thanksgiving a little early, don't you think? We're starting the war on Thanksgiving, but really, what's going on here is a couple of things. That there's the the right wing is starting to fund a lot of school board. Uh, I mean, like they're do, they're doing national funding. Happens at the local level. That's right. their little. Bingo. Get, get, you know, get the... And this is the way that they're up. going to... That's yes, how it works for them. This is yeah. how they're going to raise money for it. Yep. That's part of it. But they're also tying it into this idea that they're trying to get rid of our heritage. This is like, you could draw a straight line to this, to like, you know, the Confederate flag, you know, uh, and there's a, there is a big panic, I think. You know, it is one thing to say that they're going to be able to control... Uh, uh, our federal government for years to come, uh, perhaps, based upon this voting stuff. But what they won't be able to control is that they're losing the culture war. And the culture war, in their respect, is they want to maintain, like they say, this heritage. Well, what, what, what is the heritage he's talking about? Like, nobody's talking about erasing anything other than the uh, systems of, of, of racism and misogyny that, that, that have marked uh, this country. But there's also this overlap. I'm sure they're looking at cross tabs, like behind the scenes, whoever is creating this messaging strategy. They're looking, they're saying, okay, well, teachers are really popular right now, even in red states. We've seen these red state revolts. So how do we keep our mission to privatize the country, take on the largest union that funds Democrats, the teachers union, um, and sign, but, but, but how do we loop people into that fight when they're they're, they're actually supporting their teachers and they're actually supporting schools. So how do we loop them in? Oh, we paint them as racist. We paint them as people who are, uh, you know, trying to erase history. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, this is like a uh, threefer or something for them. What, the war on Thanksgiving, critical race theory and white replacement theory? Uh, well, the war on thing, yeah, Advertising. holidays now. They can just they can just slot that in. No, I, also, I mean they were starting that in the fall, right? Like that's the uh, yeah, it's right exactly. Wait, what was the what was the fourth? I don't know. Okay. The strategy of just like privatizing public schools. Right, 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 right. There we go. Boom. Boy, Will Kane. Boy, the real goal. I I just I you know when I see that guy like I knew him years ago at uh, you know at CNN I would run into him and to like jeez. I've known actors who I feel are less committed to what they're doing than that uh, in terms of generating like, like, boy, uh, maybe, maybe something changed in his life. I don't know. But uh, that is, that is impressive work. Join the men's rights movement and he's just very committed. I think it comes with a haircut, maybe. Oh, do um, we have that Marjorie Taylor Greene one? That would be my next. Uh... Well, let's, let's play. This is important. Okay. This, this, this uh, by Mitch McConnell on the Hugh Hewitt show. Yeah is um, 
it, it's a clarion call to the Biden administration that they need to move quicker. It is, it puts lie to Joe Manchin's like, you know, fig leaf of bipartisanship and all that. I mean, come on, give me a break here. This is just absurd. Uh, here's Mitch McConnell conceding that uh, there's no way Joe Biden will be able to fill a, if, if, if he is in charge of the Senate, a, a Supreme Court uh, seat in 2024. Probably not in 2023 either. He's getting there. There's no way he's going to uh, if he gets the Senate. Now, it's not a slam dunk that the Republicans are going to get the Senate back. It really isn't. There's a couple of vulnerable Democrats, but there's like a half a dozen uh, vulnerable uh, Republicans or empty seats. So it's not a slam dunk here. We, we, there, it's possible Democrats may pick up a, a seat or two. They certainly could if uh, people are mobilized. But here's Mitch McConnell, and he knows he's mobilizing his base. That's what this is about. Go. If you regain the majority in 2022 for the Republicans, and there's a very good chance of that happening. I'll come back to the individual races in a second. Would the rule that you applied in 2016 to the Scalia vacancy apply in 2024 to any vacancy that occurred then? Well, I think in the middle of a presidential election, if you have a Senate of the opposite party of the president, you have to go back to the 1880s to find the last time a vacancy was filled. So I think it's highly unlikely. In fact, no, I don't think either party, if it controlled, if it were different from the president, would confirm a Supreme Court nominee in the middle of an election. What was different in 2020 was we were of the same party as the correct. And that's why we went ahead with it. The sacrosanct rules of the Senate with the, well, it depends on which party is in charge. um, No, 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 uh, no, right. right. It's like it's if the Senate and the presidency are held by the same party in an election year, then it's a okay. But if that's not the case, if the Democrats hold the Senate and it's a Republican or whatever the case may be, he's like he he, he, hypocrisy shaming him isn't even worth it at this point. Like it doesn't work. I mean, remember all those videos of like the 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 vote with um garland and like uh, how they all resurfaced and they all flipped their it doesn't even work these it's it's... there is no hypocrisy shaming but this is him motivating his base Mm -hmm. and he knows this is one of the bigger reasons that uh uh, that uh, donald trump won that never gets the attention that it deserves was that merrick garland uh vacancy uh, or that that vacancy on the Supreme Court and and Obama's com- utter failure in which to politicize it, uh, because the, that is what I can tell you this. Um, I had I, I had uh, a breakfast with a with a guy, uh, a college friend who I've only seen twice in the past twenty five years, and it turns out he's now reborn. He was not at the time, and uh, this is the first time that we actually the second time we've seen each other since uh, I found that out. And I uh, lives born again Christian. Yeah. When you say reborn, okay. yep. you know that going in. Um, oh yeah, are you kidding? Uh, now, now, uh, yeah. And we had our first uh, political conversation, and because uh, I wasn't sure where he was politically, and you can guess. Uh, but the the fear that they have on the right about even like the gun control, for instance. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's been no laws passed. You can't like everything from terms of gun control over the past 15 years has completely gone in the absolute opposite direction of what your fears are. He said, well, there's people talking about stacking the Supreme Court. And I'm like, yeah, that's like people like me, like Joe Biden's not saying that. Um, And they are so good at activating their fear. It takes so little that when Mitch McConnell gets out there and says, I will protect you from a 6-3 court, right, from happening, because that's what it would be, right? I mean, Breyer steps down. It's still 6-3. I will protect you from the the potential of a 6-3 conservative majority. Um, That activates them. Yeah. And he knows what he's doing. And the, the, the Democrats evangelical- don't play that game at yeah, all. And, the, and they're bad at it. Well, one, I mean, they're not getting rid of the filibuster, which would put in place the voting protections that would, like, make sure that this is less likely to happen and save the democracy, which has incredible urgency. I mean, these comments just just, just color that urgency. Um, yeah, and, and, oh, shoot, I totally lost my train of thought. What was I going to say? 
Well, they're not. He's you know, they, they are not reacting to this. Joe Manchin is, is pretending like these things are not being said and they're not going to vote for uh, the election reform that they're going to need. I mean, oh, I totally lost it. Go on, Nomi. Well, I don't know. I'm just wondering why, like, there aren't ads targeting them. That's I'm just sitting here thinking like everyone's frustrated, but I don't see any money flowing into any sort of active campaign to drag them. Oh, you know, you don't need that much to drag. I really don't. I think the pressure points are so. I mean, there was a call to, I think there's some progressives who called to go to um, Manchin's office. I, you know, Rev Barber. Yeah, we actually have a clip. Oh, sorry. Um, we actually have a clip of that right now. I guess um, it's in the ether. Here is, uh, well, Rev Barber was on uh, Joy Reid's show. And basically, you know, they had come and they had done uh, Moral Monday um, uh, there. I don't know how many people they got out there. I don't know, but Joe Manchin doesn't care about that. He doesn't care about that. Yeah. He, he really doesn't. I think that's like... Thank you. I wish you had more people here so I could show uh, the people of West Virginia how I'm defying uh, the, the Democratic Party. And you got to get some coal workers in there. Yes. You got to. Um, no, no, the way you do it is you pull some coal workers in there and you get some Republicans who are for ending the filibuster for their own weird reasons. So uh, let's play this clip. Uh, there are four states, I think, off the top of my head that are about to end extended unemployment benefits. Alaska um, is one of them. I cannot remember what the other uh, three states are, but we're about to see about 25 Republican states are going to do this over the course of the, the, the coming weeks and months. Here is uh, Indiana uh, Republican Representative um, Jackie Walorski. Listen to, to this is just stunning. And I want to just say this, too, as, as just sort of like fill in the context. We are seeing the peaks of the commodities that hit, uh, you know, inflation drop. They're starting to drop now. If you look at like lumber um, there, uh, you know, folks are uh, if you look in the, like the lumber market, people are predicting price drops. We're starting to see our productive uh, capacity ramp up and we're starting to see more productive ability to reach the capacity that we have and so uh, dollars are going to drop the same thing's going to happen with with workers on some level because um you know people are still finding babysitters people are still figuring out child care they're changing their habits so they can go back to work but listen to this uh, indiana uh, republican I am so thankful to Governor Eric Holcomb for lifting the extension of the unemployment in the state of Indiana. You know, I sent him a letter last week with uh, Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise, our leaders, and Kevin Brady, the ranking member of the Ways and Means Committee, asking every single governor in every red state to drop that extension of unemployment. It is so unfair for CEOs in my district and in the state of Indiana trying to compete with the federal government for workers. You know, we've had so many places closed in the Indiana 2nd District. If this isn't just a restaurant issue, this is a manufacturing issue, this is a mom and pop issue, it's impossible and unfair to compete with that kind of money that's rolling out from the federal government. We need our jobs filled, we need COVID in the rear view oh, mirror. Anymore. So unfair to CEOs. And I love the fact that the federal government cannot create jobs. They can only compete with, for jobs. Five, like, right? It was like seven, eight years ago. They were like, yeah, federal government can't comp uh, uh, um. The idea that CEOs, poor CEOs, oh. have to compete with the idea that their workers would be able to feed themselves or maybe be able to pay for their rent or maybe be able to pay for... If they ever have an opportunity to go to a movie uh, without Sam, having Sam. Well, climate change, not fair, not fair. But climate change is happening. And now these CEOs need to have another home to escape their uh, winter storm or the power grid going out in Texas. So they need that extra home and they can't afford to give their workers 20 more cents it's an all, hour. It's it's so unfair to CEOs to not deprive labor to the point where they have to go serve them at their place of business it's really unfair to work ceos oh unfair i know chipotle just has to raise its its uh its burrito price by 25 cents or what okay. so, i mean but you say the chipotle has to raise their you understand 
that that CEO's compensation is tied into their stock value and that that stock value is tied into their ability to cut costs. And so if their labor costs go up even an iota, that that person could lose don't tell me. 10% of their $25 million bonus at the end of the but year. But the thing is, is that they're not, well, now I'm dropping character. They're not like when these wages are going up and they're having to treat their workers a little bit better to incentivize people to come back to work, even though, as you say, like these, these jobs aren't even there in the way that the Republican politicians are pretending that they are going to be. Um, like they, 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 it's not coming out of CEO pay. It's just not. They're raising prices on goods. It might. It might come out of CEO pay. Oh, but like that's an incredible in a but very so now what? I don't Right, but like like it should come out of CEO pay is the I point. Agree. There's immense cushion for wages to go up even more because companies like Chipotle have have uh, one of the highest paid CEOs, I believe a top twenty high highest right. paid CEO in the country. So, you know, yeah. The that's CEO sets the budget and why would they ever do that? All right. Right. Was there a clip you wanted to get to? I was just, uh, no, I mean, there was the Marjorie Which, Taylor Greene. Oh, thing. yeah, let's get it. Yeah, we got it. We got it. Let's do it. All right. Let's do the final clip of the day. Folks, um, we'll take uh, one phone call after this. Let me just try this game because we, we tried it first. Yes. Call him from a 308 area code. Got to be quick. Folks, we're not going to get to any other calls. Sorry. 308. Who's this? Hey, Sam. It's Kowalski in Nebraska. Kowalski. We just got a minute, bud. Hey, just wanted to give you a quick little ag report. Prices are holding steady. The hot weather is hitting at a very terrible time. Uh, all in all, it's looking like it's going to be an average year. Ah, that well, is all. The average is not bad. Hey, and I will send you an email about those uh, shirts. All right. And also, to hell with Jimmy Dore, or as he will be referred to from now on, Jimmy Three. There you go. <laughs> right. Appreciate the call. All right, folks, that's it for the calling uh, portion of our uh, program. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, take it away, Emma. Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, went to the Holocaust Museum, and now oh. she understands that the Holocaust was actually pretty bad, and it's not entirely comparable to not being able to go mask off to an NBA playoff game or to the local deli down the street. Let's uh, take a listen to everything she learned. Always want to remind everyone I'm very much a normal person and I think it's important for me to always be transparent and pause it for one second. Pause it for one second. Listen, she's a normal person. I remember how normal she was. Alexandria hey, come out and going, play like a grown man a grown woman rather uh, you know lifting up the letter thing of a, of a, of a congressperson Alexandria or putting on like that poster about uh, you know because she wanted to make the there mother are two genders yes uh, feel bad about her uh, her, her trans uh, 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 daughter or son I can't remember the details that's so normal but continue with uh and, and honest and I just want to tell you all I'm, I'm really really lucky uh, I was blessed with I am blessed with amazing parents and my dad just passed away in April but I will say he taught me some great things and one of the best lessons that my father always taught me was when you make a mistake you should own it and I have made a mistake and it's really bothered me for a couple of weeks now. And so I definitely want to own it. This afternoon, I visited the Holocaust Museum. The Holocaust is, there's nothing comparable to it. It's, it's, it happened and, you know, over 6 million Jewish people were murdered. More than that, there were not just Jewish people, black people, Christians, all kinds of children, people that, that the Nazis didn't believe were good enough or perfect enough. And it's off script the now. Of the Holocaust are something that some people don't even believe happened. And some people deny, but there is no comparison to the Holocaust. And there are words that I have said, remarks that I've made that I know are offensive. For that I want to apologize and I am I am just fine and very glad to be able to come out here and do that because I believe it's important I believe
believe that if we're going to lead, we need to be able to lead in a way where if we've messed up, it's very important for us to say we're sorry. Today is the day that Marjorie Taylor Greene became president. <laughs> there you go. Let's uh, look at this, um, uh, put up this uh, tweet. This is Ben Jacobs. Uh, she was asked after your visit to the Holocaust Museum today, earlier uh, during recess, you compared Democrats to the National Socialist Worker Party. <laughs> is that something oh you, my God. <laughs> you reflected on everything that the Nazi Party did? And she said, well, you know, socialism is extremely dangerous and so is communism. And any time a government moves into policies where there is more control and there's more freedoms taken away, yes, that is a danger for everyone. Socialism and, and communism, mm -hmm. not the fascism. And I think that is something we should all be wary of. Anytime you have things like censorship with social media, like the Nazis were like banning people from Twitter. Uh, anytime you could have things, I added that part. Uh, anytime we have things being taught where one race is being told it is racist, like critical race theory, those are problems. Oh, my God. These it are happens. things we are seeing in policies coming out of the Democratic Party that I think are dangerous for everyone. That's why I'm against them. And I'll never stop saying I'm very much on track and never stop saying we have to save Americans and stop socialism. There's no veteran that signed up to serve the military and there's nobody that fought for our country because they wanted America to be a socialist country. They all did it because they want America to be a free country. Question. Huh. So you still stand by that analogy? That's the important thing to remember. Thank you guys so much. We've got to head out to vote. Um, <clears throat> how long did she spend in that museum? Uh, enough, enough time to understand it happened. Yep, that was good. Yeah, I like that because I, I was not exactly sure she believed it happened. It was like a 50-50 proposition. She had to get Christians in there. Christians were killed too, incidentally. Yes, they were gay though, so she left out that part. Left out that part. Yeah, um, but uh, but good for her. I mean, I think she kind of honestly was... Hey, she's a normal person. Yeah, she's a, right, a normal person who compares that... Exactly. But she she clearly heard it from someone in Republican leadership. Like, we can't necessarily smear Ilhan Omar as an anti-Semite when we got you, you know. Exactly. That is exactly what was going on. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. I was wondering, like, what, what like, I wonder how this brought about, because it's not like she's, you know, she's just... She's just a shit poster, essentially. She's and got no committee assignment. She's got, she's got, no, got no power. Yeah, she's got yeah. nothing to do. But uh, somebody went to her and said, "Look, look, it does not. You're hurting our ability to attack uh, Ilma, without a doubt. Without a doubt, that's exactly what it is. Nailed it." All right, folks, going to read a couple of IMs and we got to get out of here. Ra Rampaging Toaster, as a Virginia, I made it part of my daily routine to bug Mark Warner's office about the filibuster. You guys have any tips or key points I should be sure to hit? I would also say um, go it alone, do reconciliation. We're watching you. We need infrastructure. Anybody can weigh in on that? Have Just you? Go, go to his lawn and, and put a tent up. Yeah. Right. Have you read my email? An MRA call has been brought to you by the Discord community. He was on the server one day and said he would call in. To say the least, we did not try to convince him not to. That was fantastic. Appreciate it. There you go. Uh, Rudy Slippers. Hey, Sam and Emma, any thoughts on this Aaron Mate, Anna Kasparian drama? The Demi Acolytes have been swarming every podcast, YouTube show, and Twitter post by TYT. It's a cult like as MAGA chuds. Well, we spent a lot of time on that yes. already. Uh, Catholic. Uh, report came out uh, of the 3.5 million votes cast in Wisconsin. 800,000 didn't come out to vote in 2016, but did in 2020. And that cohort leaned Trump Republican. So it looks like a higher turnout equaling more Democratic votes does not seem to be the case. The bigger question is, is just a Wisconsin trend or will this be reflected on a national level? It really depends on how uh, Democrats uh, mobilize. Uh, Bob's burger is people. Did Emma notice that Rodiger said obfuscate? It's the correct pronunciation. Panda. It's painful out uh, my way, folks. 34% vaccination rate in our country. IUC, uh, um, IUCs? Am I saying that? IUCs. ICUs? Uh, yeah, it should be ICUs, but they wrote <laughs> IUCs. Full. We are redirecting away from our hospitals. It's amazing how strong the anti-vax movement really is. I wonder where that is. Uh, left uh, left leckoning. The men's right activist is just repeating Jordan Peterson talking points about men being scared because they're teaching about boys and stop putting gum and girls hair on the playground. At least when Jordan Peterson is entertaining, when he cries about Frozen. Jonathan Armstead, 
Uh, Emma, thanks for pointing out Jimmy Durr's racial resentment. Jimmy once said that Obama wouldn't be remembered in history as anything other than the Jackie Robinson of politics. Alonzo Bowden was on and pointed out that Jackie Robinson was Rookie of the Year and MVP, and likewise, Obama got people insurance coverage. Jimmy sat there with a stupid look on his face. I don't think he knew Jackie Robinson was a baseball player. I think that he, I was done with that dude after that. I think he was stealing that line from Michael Eric Dyson, if you guys remember that. Huh. Adventure uh, of Bottoming Sam. This reminds me, did you see the New Hampshire Libertarian Party endorse child labor? Yeah, I did see <laughs> that. Uh, yeah. Uchi Wally. The draft was instituted when women didn't have the right to vote. Right. Indeed. And Laura from Somerville. That caller needs to read some Jackson Cats. Yikes. And two more. Just asking questions. Uh, so in a nutshell, why is right-wing messaging so confused, contradicting, and undergrounded? It is because the message, definitionally unpopular. I mean, their movement retains a hierarchy with a shrinking but more powerful head. When it comes to the MRI guy on Funny Greg with a YouTube show, does he realize movements for equality were materially based? Why not jump into mainstream movements for equal equality instead of prematurely reacting to pull progress back? Is the end goal the same? Are women human? Yeah, I mean, the whole thing was just sort of, it's bizarre. I do think that there's some psychological things uh, as a society, culturally, that we need to readjust expectations for men uh, without a doubt. And I do think it seems reasonable to me that there could be less empathy for men in, that, in those type of, like, you know, Milgram-style experiments. But uh, that's not a rights issue. It's because men have had more power, and so you're, you're like, in your mind, you're, you're psychologically predisposed to feel sympathetic to, uh, you know, women who have, are perceived to have less power absolutely and it's like a, a child or a dog it's like it's, and, and i would say that like you know there's a, a significant uh, amount of feminism that uh recognizes that uh men are going to have to the expectations that we place on men also are going to have to adjust um yes. and that is a positive in my mind and i would even argue from in this guy's mind and uh, i'm not saying women that are akin to dogs or children just saying like you know that forced vasectomies sterno <laughs> in a world where there can be no facts anything can be true men can be the oppressed gender but only if the stats around domestic violence are deemed invalid meanwhile this is the final i am of the day from sterno Looking forward to the Nokimi and Seder show. <laughs> uh, you can check out the Nokimi show at 3 p.m., folks, on the uh, Nokimi YouTube channel. Spell it right. <laughs> Miki uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel. Uh, Emma, Matt, Nomi, Brendan, great job today. See you, folks, tomorrow. Lively show. It might take a straight back to get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick Choice was made for the option where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess somehow I lost my drive.